a very good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to our webinar on Get a Life, Get Literature, a Hangout for Nerds. Now, the tagline was suggested by Dr. Chia Sui Yi, who reasoned that literature is life, and life is literature, and we should live life to the fullest, and the more you read, the more life and more fulfilled life you get. So thank you, Dr. Chia. And as for the nerd bit, right, we are the smart and intelligent ones, the envy of many who wants to be wannabe nerds, but not there yet. So now the term nerds uh, are for the cool, learned, and uh, intelligent, clever people. <laughs> All right. So this is the nerds hangout where this group actually reads a lot. <laughs> okay. Now, this webinar is actually a continuation of an extension of our UBSM Digital Education Odyssey 2.0 that we co-organized uh, recently with the support of the Ministry of Education, Private Education Department, along with the Cambridge Assessment and International Education, uh, also supported by Lenovo and Google for Education. Now, this Digital Education Odyssey 2.1 event is being organized due to the popular demand from the literature community that tune in to the earlier uh, conference, all right? And then uh, we are also very happy and very thankful to have the support of uh, MOE again. And this time, uh, Melta came forward to support being the powerhouse and uh, the, the, the authority for anything that is English. And also, we would also like to thank the University of Nottingham uh, School of Education for lending the support uh, for this event as well. Now, each time when I hear about Melta or the University of Mount Nottingham is being mentioned, right? I do have very, very fond memories of the late Professor Ghana, all right? Whom we have been serving together for many, many awesome years. And actually we do miss him dearly for every English conference that I go to actually, uh, as such how we wish he's still with us and be one of the panel speakers here as well. But then, uh, I mean, we, we keep in close to our hearts while we enjoy our ourselves, all right? And the thing is that um, by, by forming this committee, all right, uh, by uh, Melta, Nottingham and, and us and a few friends gathered together from this committee, we have actually picked a team of uh, super literature characters. <laughs> <laughs> or they are the authority in the various education segment. And these people have brought them together like a league of extraordinary gentlemen or superstar to share with you. So sit back and enjoy yourselves in this hangout. All right. So the session will, will basically have, uh, uh, what I call that? Uh, Masaki will be sharing about a literature database on how we could actually help teachers and uh, followed by a panel of six uh, panel speakers from various education segments. And later on, we will have some guest speakers sharing as well. And uh, also Q and A uh, questions from the uh, audience actually. So the things that uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite my co-host, uh, Dr. Tu Wei Kyung to say a few words. Over to you, Dr. Tu. Thanks. Uh, uh, before Wei Kyung, uh, share uh, the things that uh, can can Kashmir, can you share the the screen again? Yeah, this is uh, specially arranged by uh, Melta Committee. Uh, Inchek Warit has actually arranged this uh, registration for you guys. Now, those of you who are teachers and you would like to uh, register for your SPL KPM for KPM teachers, you may do that. Either you you use your phone to scan the QR code or you go to the tiny URL and register to make things easy for you to claim your teacher's training credit hours. All right, uh, we'll share this again in the middle of the event and as far as the end of the event. So we'll sit back and enjoy. So over to you, uh, Prof. Tu. Thanks, Kit. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Wei Kyung from School of Education. Um, School of Education is extremely happy as usual, uh, to be invited to be one of the co-organizer of uh, this event. Um, literature in English is always close to our hearts in the School of Education, University of Nottingham, Malaysia, uh, with, the with the programs that we offer Bachelor of 
uh, of arts and Bachelor of Education in Tiso, uh, literature play a bigger role, a very big role in our curriculum because we believe that through literature, uh, we will be able to shape our students to become a more effective teachers in the classroom. And today, once again, um, this is a time for us to get together, to know that, okay, there's always someone there uh, who will understand us in literature, and there is a world for us to explore, and it's vast. And once again, thank you so much, uh, University Bookstores, uh, Malaysia, um, Ministry of uh, Education, um, uh, for co-organizing this, as well as not to forget Melta, always there, uh, to support the promote the promotions of literature in English in Malaysia. So without further ado, so I will let Keith, back to you. To take okay, over. thank you, Wei Kiong. Uh, Wei Kiong is really a humble guy. Being a doctor, and he always don't want people to call him doctor, just call him Wei Kiong would do. <laughs> okay, so thanks, Wei Kiong. Uh, we are actually very blessed to have uh, Sri Kolompo uh, School to treat us with a performance, uh, Creative Shakespeare Online. This performance is created during the lockdown uh, and COVID times, actually. And now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Chia Sui Yi, the principal of Sri Kolompo Primary School, to share more about this uh, online performance. Dr. Chia, thank you for organizing this. Over to you. Thank you, Keith. The pleasure is all ours. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sui Yi from Sri Kuala Lumpur Primary School. Um, in fact, I'm also wearing another hat. I'm also representing Melta here. So as Keith has mentioned to all of you, this is like a real hangout for everyone who either has lived literature as part of their lives all this while, or is living literature as part of your lives, or is you are going to. Nevertheless, let me begin by giving you a little intro to this drama performance by our children. And let me attempt to give you this intro in a rather storytelling way. So here goes, ladies and gentlemen. A not too long time ago, there lied a hope to perform Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream on stage in this school called Sri Kuala Lumpur. And then guess what? COVID-19 happened and along with it came MCO, CMCO, EMCO, RMCO, and et cetera, et cetera, COs. Hence, the stage performance of Midsummer Nights was to remain a dream, or so we adults thought. And then some 10 to 12 year old children proved us wrong, determined that the show must go on. These children not only worked on the script and costumes, but they also learned to use video editing softwares to turn a live performance into an online web series, producing nine episodes over a period of eight months while they were attending lessons remotely from home. And so it gives me great pleasure to present to you a short video showcasing the productions of these amazing children you will see how they interpreted a classic by transforming it to a rather rainforest version, presenting the characters, including the infamous love triangle in the form of animals, while intricately teasing out their concerns over current issues that were important to them. Perhaps you may even find the video a little lacking from a professional angle, but ladies and gentlemen, it is deliberately kept that way to remind us these are the works of children exploring the world of literature. And I hope you will find joy seeing how resilient, creative, and wonderful these children have been during such turbulent times. So now I'm inviting all of you sit back Relax, as Keith mentioned, perhaps with a popcorn or a cup of coffee in your hand. Enjoy Creative Shakespeare Online from Sri Kuala Lumpur International Primary School. Enjoy.
inner land where magic is possible and things aren't quite what they seem. There is love and conflict and everything in between. Yes, indeed. She looks less than pleased. They always argue. It's been like this for a long time. Oh, look! Father Planet signing in. Can you please relax? As guardian of the forest, you should be zen, like your namesake, isn't it? Look, you seem completely incapable of running this magical forest. Hence, I am taking charge of it now. There is much to be done and sitting here in this petty video call you have just set up is a waste of time. This conversation is over. Hmm, what's the fastest way to get someone to fall in love with me? Oh, I've got an idea! A brilliant one too! Here goes! One, two, three, whoosh! The great Bolang of Tiger Forest scavenging for crabs at this point. I just wish I was vegetarian. Tell us about how this is affecting you. So my husband and I, we've been married for three years. We have this stuck bear claiming she's a better match for my husband. I swear, by the wish that I will lose for D to prove her false that says I love D not. I am not. Hi, I'm your husband. Ew. Last night, our Prime Minister issued an emergency broadcast. Dear citizens of No Rain Forest, the government has been working together with Tiger Forest in developing our very own water treatment system. Wow, thank you. It's really nice. Uh, they are all primary school students, Dr. Cha. Yes, these are children of 10 to 12 years old. Wow, that's cool, yeah. <laughs> yes, they are extremely I'm sure you have such them. fun, right, doing this we with did. them. I wanted to give credit to the teachers who have been empowering the children. In fact, one of the teachers who's been working closely with the children, empowering them, encouraging them, motivating them, is one of our panel speakers, which all of you, whom all of you will have a chance of meeting later on. Uh, I'm that's not cool. going to mentioned the name yet um <laughs> keith i'll leave that to you <laughs> i hope you have all enjoyed that i think what what we we would like to to say here from as teachers or even as the principal of the school is that we felt very blessed keith i know you like you all you're someone who always count your blessings and grateful for what you have in life and likewise we, we feel really blessed blessed to have these children because they refuse to give up and that's what they have given to us. Yeah. Thank you. I think Thank maybe you. someday Sri Kel should run a workshop to teach us how to do this kind of a performance with and how to stitch it together and such like that. You see, one of the biggest challenges is to getting kids at the primary school level or even preschool level to concentrate and to to get their attention is uh is a uh, is a difficult task. And if you guys can do this so 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 nice and so perfectly done. It, it's really an achievement. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Chia and uh, Sri Kolompo. Thank you for sharing. Thank uh, you over for to you, us. Prof. Tu, to introduce uh, our our guests. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, so the next um, the next speaker, I would like to invite 
the presidents of Malaysian English Language Teaching Associations, Dr. Ramshnai, to welcome all of us to this event. Uh, Dr. Ramesh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Wikyong. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it gives me great pleasure to say a few words on behalf of the Malaysian English Language Teaching Association. Uh, I'd like to first uh, thank and congratulate uh, UBSN and the MELTA Special Interest Group Bureau for organizing this, this uh, timely uh, webinar. Um, I'd also like to thank our Vice President, Dr. Chas Ridley, for um, supporting the organization of this, this event. Um, we recently ran an international conference in uh, July, and we obviously ran it online. And in an online format, we had to decide on the number of tracks that we wanted to, to have, because you know, given the limitations of, of an online uh, platform, uh, we could only uh, allocate so many tracks. And one of the tracks that we decided on was a track on literature. Interestingly, when we put out the call for papers, the, the last track to get filled was the literature track. Um, it, the, the uptake uh, for presentations in the literature, literature track was rather slow compared to uh, submissions of abstracts for the other tracks, such as that on pedagogy, um, on technology, and uh, several other tracks. Um, I think that in, that in itself is an interesting observation, but perhaps the panel members today may want to, to um, take this discussion further. It was interesting uh, to note that the uh, uh, interest in uh, literature was uh, uh, a little, uh, I wouldn't say less, but the, the uptake of uh, people submitting abstracts for the literature component, for the literature track, um, was somewhat less compared to interest in text. And we wonder why. So perhaps that is something that, that uh, you know, the panel members this afternoon uh, can take up and, and discuss further. Obviously, as English language teaching practitioners, we know that literature is an, uh, an important part in ALT. Uh, help children build their vocabulary, have fun, as we saw in the, the presentation with the students uh, today. And even with the limitations of, uh, um, you know, um, non-face-to-face classroom interaction, it appears that the students had a great deal of uh, uh, fun, uh, in, you know, putting that, that presentation together. So why do we not see um, literature playing, uh, or rather being more prominent in our English language classrooms? Well, I, th I think these are some of the issues and questions that we would like to um, reflect on and discuss in this presentation today. So on behalf of Malta, I'd like to thank all the presenters for making the time to, to join us. And I wish you all uh, an enjoyable uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof Ramesh. Thank you for joining, sharing, and uh, also uh, supporting us in this event. Uh, it's really wonderful to have uh, Melta and the uh, whole committee coming together to serve. Uh, next, we will have uh, the highlight of the day where we would like to invite uh, Masaki Morisawa, the, uh, the senior manager for Gale uh, company. Gale is one of the largest uh, online company in the world. In fact, there are so many companies under Gale. And uh, like National Geographic is just one of the many, many, many companies that Gale actually uh, owns. And uh, we'd like to invite uh, Masaki to share on uh, Gale literature reference and how we can actually help English uh, literature educators uh, to teach English literature. In fact, uh, Masaki has always been my favorite presenter. I really like his style of presenting. And for those of you teachers out there, do uh, observe how Masaki actually does his presentation. And most of his presentations always get five stars. No pressure, Masaki. <laughs> 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 so, okay, over to you, Masaki, and the rest of us sit back and enjoy, yeah? <laughs> 
thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you for the total lack of pressure in your introduction. Uh, it was very, very, actually it was very, very humbling to see, watch such a great performance by the 3KL primary school. I, it was, I, I thought it was really, really creative how they managed to, you know, achieve that level of creativity while everyone is in lockdown and had to, you know, uh, create those things within those physical limits. So um, I'm afraid already I'm not the best presenter during this show, but I would like to just um, share some of my thoughts as well as do my little commercial thing as usual. So let me share my screen first. Um, this is my presentation about helping English literature educators with Gale Literature. And um, Gale Literature is a suite of products that we produce. It's an online product. But be before I actually get into the product, I thought it might be interesting if we start it from the very beginning and tackle the most basic question, which is why literature at all? And I think um, Dr. Ramesh's speech earlier was very interesting in that among the many tracks that were offered to the Melta committee, uh, community, uh, literature was the last track to be filled. And I think that was kind of typical. Um, people are more attracted to things that are obviously practical, like learn how to educate and things like that. And literature is the least practical uh, discipline of them all. So I, I always kind of start my presentations by addressing that question, why literature? And of course, there is no single answer to that question. Of course, if there were, you lose the point about literature. But I thought for this um, particular one, I would go back in time and share with you an interesting article that was written about 20 years ago by uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, who is a very prominent Peruvian author. This article was written in 2001, and it's entitled Why Literature? And it's very interesting. Although this article is 20 years old, um, a lot of the points that are made are still very, very potent and um, ring true to us. And I quote from some of his um, passages that reading good literature is an experience of pleasure, of course, but it is also an experience of learning what and how we are in our human integrity, in our human imperfection, with our actions, our dreams, and our ghosts, alone, and in relationships that link us to others, in our public image, and in the secret recesses of our consciousness. And he goes on to paraphrase what he just mentioned, that basically li literature is about everything. It's about the human condition. Why are we? Why are we here? And what, what, what is the purpose of all this? And um, it's really, really great um, a testament to literature that it can address many, many things, including our present condition, the way we are under lockdown today. Yeah. And for instance, I found this um, article, which is not a spectacular article. This is a very typical article that I'm sure you've read similar articles from the news from many, many other outlets, but it's entitled, When Will the Pandemic End? Scientists just don't know. And what caught me as interesting in this article was the um, starting sentence. Basically, the author kind of sarcastically begins by saying, it's basically over already. It will end this October or maybe it won't be over till next spring or late next year or two or three years down the road. And of course, the answer is nobody really knows when this thing is going to end, but we keep on waiting and hoping for it to end. And when I was reading this sentence, this reminded me of a very, very famous literary work. And some of you may be very familiar with this one. You might see this image and instantly say, ah, that work, because it's a very famous work that was written in the 1950s, or actually was written in the 1940s, but first performed in the 1950s. It was the play by Samuel Beckett called Waiting for Godot. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this work, it was a very, very revolutionary work and has and continues to have a very, very strong impact on modern theater 
it, because nothing really happens in this play. There are only five characters, and for most of the time, there are only two, these two tramps on the stage with this little tree, which is basically the only prop, the only permanent prop on the stage, and they just talk to each other. I won't give you too much details about the play, but it was a really, really shocking and tremendous, um, tremendously um, provocative play for its time, and it continues to provoke many people. So one of the memorable lines goes, we wait, we are bored. No, don't protest. We are bored to death. There's no denying it. And this really, really kind of resonates with our current condition where we are all in lockdown, continually lo under lockdown, and we are told this is going to be the last lockdown. This is only going to last until next month, and then we'll kind of ease restrictions. But then next month they say, sorry, the cases are rising. The vaccination isn't keep, um, catching up. We need to go into a further lockdown. And it goes on and on and on and has gone on and on. And we are still waiting, hoping it will end. And this kind of tragic comic situation is really, really uh, acutely reflected in this literary work. So Waiting for Godot is a play by the Irish writer Samuel Beckett. And it was originally written and performed in French. Beckett has this kind of knack of writing his own works in a foreign language, in French. Actually, he spent most of his life in Paris. He was an Irish writer, but he emigrated to Paris and he didn't return to Ireland um, ever since. And he wrote all of his literary works originally, most of his works in French first, and then he would translate them back into English, interestingly. So it was first performed in French in 1953, and then it was performed in English in 1955. And it's a minimalist work, and it discarded all of the traditional notions of drama, whether it's like plot, character development, the drama arc, everything was just thrown out of the window, and it was presented in this very bleak and unhappening, but strangely entertaining play. So this is a really great work, and you either love it or hate it, but it's also an interesting material to teach um, students about literature and um, kind of get them interested into literature because it's so it reflects so much the present condition that everybody is under. However, it can be a challenging play. You know, a lot of a lot of the dialogue does not make a lot of sense sometimes, and nothing really happens or nothing what you think will happen in a play doesn't really happen in this play. It's kind of repet repetitious, and in the ending, it ends where it actually began. So it's like a circular work that goes on and on for eternity. So some students might understandably be puzzled, and even students who um, appreciate the work might need a little bit of help in interpreting and deepening their appreciation of the play. So this is where we get into studying literature, which is one step further than actually just reading and enjoying a work of literature. And in order to study literature, as many of you teachers would know, you need the primary source, which is the work itself, in this case, which is the play Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. But you also need additional material which is generally called secondary material. That might be a bibliography of works, of all of the works that have been written about Samuel Beckett and Waiting for Gatto, or it can be a biographical work about Samuel Beckett, his life and work. It can be criticisms or reviews that were written by different people in different periods from different angles about this work or you can consult dictionaries, encyclopedias for definitions of things. You can read interviews by the authors. You can read journal articles written, magaz magazine and newspaper articles and books, and also multimedia. And ultimately all of the secondary material helps you in deepening your understanding 
and uh, your appreciation of the literary work. So you, it takes you to a, a deeper level in your appreciation. And what we at Gale hope to do for you teachers is to provide all of this material in a very packaged environment, which is called Gale Literature, where we bring together millions, literally, literally millions of criticism, biographies, work overviews, and reference works combined with journals and literary works themselves, as well as multimedia, all in a single package, in a single uh, cross-searchable environment where students can dig in and find, and teachers can also dig in and find many different uh, material about or uh, related to the work in question. So this is what I call the circle of literature studies. And when you're studying literature, as opposed to just plainly reading for enjoyment, these are the types of material that you really need to engage with. And um, they might be biographies, literary criticisms, literary works, multimedia, primary sources, literary journals. All of this is contained in Gale literature. So I would like you to take a look. So I will um, share my screen on my browser for a second. And I hope you are seeing my screen. This is the top page of Gale literature. It's a very simple, uh, plain interface it has a search box, and I will just search for waiting for auto. It even has autocomplete to help you with the spelling. And once you do a search, you will be shown with these various types of material that appear under these um, headings. So you have literature criticism. We have 1,684 of them biographies, topic and work overviews, reviews and news, primary sources and literary works, and multimedia. And usually I recommend for students uh, that they go to the topic and work overviews parts um, part first, because this is the most student friendly or beginner friendly type of content. And these are specifically uh, written for students and uh, my favorite one is from the series called Drama for Students, which is also published by Gale. And you can get a very good introduction to waiting for um, Gato, for example, from um, Drama for Students. Excuse me, I'm looking for the entry that I was going to show you. Here it is. So this is from a work called Drama for Students, and it gives you a very, very good introduction written by a literary teacher about this work, its importance, its possible, some possible interpretations, gives you a biography of the author, who was Samuel Beckett, what did he do, what kind of works did he write, and a plot summary by each act. And then it also continues by giving um, analyses of some of the basic characters that appear in the play and various ways, angles of interpreting this work, such as themes and um, symbols and other uh, angles are shown. So this is a really great place to start when you have just uh, read the play or watched the performance and you kind of remember what happened, but you still need some help to understand or help um, interpret some of the uh, things that you still can't really put your finger on. And this is a really great um, place to open the student to, to the many possible interpretations that is uh, um, possible for this kind of literary work. After they have seen such an overview, they can perhaps go to the biographies if they're interested in the author and um, read a more in-depth biography about um, Samuel Beckett, for example. And um, this is taken from our Dictionary of Literary Biography series. Each of these are written by scholars. So it's not a really simple who's who kind of biography, but it's a literary biography, tracing the footsteps of the author and analyzing his literary output uh, um, as he or she lived. And after you've had a thorough understanding of that author themselves, 
maybe now you're ready to tackle some literary criticism, which is more kind of high level work. And the interesting thing about um, literature is that it doesn't really age. Um, in the world of, say, science or engineering, people are always looking for the most latest articles because the old ones uh, that were written maybe 20 or 30 years ago are probably no longer relevant in those fields. But the great thing about literature is you can return to early um, criticisms that may have been written when the work was first performed or was first written and still get some really interesting understanding out of the out of it. So you can read, for instance, a 1956 review of Waiting for Godot, which was uh, pretty much contemporary when it was first performed. Or you can read more recent reviews about Waiting for Godot in theater journals. Or you can also read uh, overviews of what is the enduring popularity of Waiting for Godot. So this is like a survey of all the different uh, performances and interpretations that have happened over the time. There are many different angles. There are theological arguments, and there are um, arguments about influences with other works and um, comparisons with other important literary works like Sartre's The Wall here, and it can go on and on and on. So these are really interesting, but perhaps sometimes for the student, this is a little bit too much sometimes. 1,684 articles of literary criticisms can kind of overwhelm some students. But we also have very student-friendly tools here, like the Topic Finder, which generates a kind of a heat map of the keywords that appear in all of these articles. And they can look at it visually, so they can look at history or human condition or other articles like Noel. And this one is kind of interesting because Noel is actually a traditional Japanese theater, but there are some similarities with Beckett's plays, such as, for instance, the very bleak setting where there's only a little tree representing all trees, presumably. That's very, very similar to Noel plays. And you can read this article and find some similarities between Beckett's plays and Noel. And it's, the great thing is you can just kind of play around with this heat map and get interesting ideas um, instead of looking at a long list of articles in the search results. And you can also look at recent reviews, um, such as the newest ones. And this one is very interesting. Um, this is from this year. It's a new play that is produced in Broadway called Pass Over, which uh, consciously copies Waiting for Godot, but places, in a, places the whole dialogue in a city street setting between two African-American characters that are scared of the police. So you can see how literature gets transformed and how the influence kind of carries on into most contemporary works and is made relevant to the times. I could go on and on and on, but of course um, I have limited time, so I'll stop my presentation here, but you kind of get the idea of the richness of, of the Gale Literature Platform. So I will return to my slides. So Gale Literature is really, really an interesting platform that gives unmatched variety and depth. We have many different types of content from many different sources that is not available in the open web. And it's all searchable by a very simple keyword search. And if the materials are too much, you can use various filters or you can use that topic finder where you can produce a heat map and examine what are the most interesting keywords that are relevant to my interests. It's interdisciplinary. It covers not just pure literature, it's that it, it can, uh, con contains popular literature, graphic novels, history, philosophy, religion, gender studies. Many, many uh, topics in the humanities are um, intersect with literature. So it's a really interdisciplinary resource and it helps us gain new and original insights into the literary works and their authors and ultimately 
about ourselves. And here I return to the Why Literature article by uh, Vargas Llosa that I quoted at the beginning. And uh, this, is, this article itself is a really compelling read. I would recommend um, that you look at it later when you have time. But I quote from his uh, very last paragraph. And although this was written 20 years ago, I think it's still very relevant. If we wish to avoid the impoverishment of our imagination and the dis disappearance of the precious dissatisfaction that refines our sensibility, and teaches us to speak with eloquence and rigor and the weakening of our freedom, then we must act. And he actually continues, more precisely, we must read. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope some of that was interesting. Wow, that was uh, really awesome. Huh? The things that uh, I've been looking at the kind of support that you have. It's so good to be an English uh, literature teacher. In fact, it's not easy to be an English literature teacher. You know? Last time in school is that you need to be the super smart, the really well-read and uh, have a lot of experience in life. Only you get to be an English literature teacher. So it's really not easy. But as uh, some of them, in fact, many of our friends who, who tune into the Digital Odyssey earlier, they want to listen to you again and want to know more about the Gale literature. In fact, uh, I'm trying to arrange with you and uh, Sean to allow a free trial uh, for the teachers who attended this, this session. In fact, many of them was telling me, if I have this, like looking at the, the biographies, the overview, the review, the literary criticism, Frankly, it's not really that difficult to get a first class or maybe a second class upper with uh, with Gale Literature help. So the things that, which is one of the reasons many of the literature enthusiasts actually ask me, can we get Masake to speak again? And uh, can we actually have a hands-on and trial of this literature thing? So I will make arrangement with you and, uh, and Sean. Uh, probably we can actually give a one-month trial, maybe starting from the 1st of... Uh, October to the 31st of October. We, we can we try to do that. And uh, for those of you who have not registered, you can tell your, your friends or colleagues or anybody that is teaching literature to register. We give you a little bit of time so that we only start the trial on the 1st of uh, October. Now, for those of you who, who missed this uh, presentation because you could be teaching or your colleague, you may be coming in late or, or have to leave early, uh, it's on Facebook Live. Uh, by tomorrow, we will put it on the YouTube channel as well. So make sure you read this. And if you're a teacher with the Ministry of Education, do register and get your <coughs> teacher's training credit hours. Okay? So, Masaki, we, we thank you so much. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure. Your, I'm very honored. Presentation. In fact, I should have changed your presentation tagline to romancing literature we, we will just get immersed faith in it imbued in it and uh if i like that book i can hang in there forever you know for ages and ages and ages if i really like the title so thank you so much for sharing i'll thank hand you, over Keith. time to wake up to introduce the next speaker yes thank you so much uh masaki because just now uh, many of the comments, everyone, like some, uh, Subarna said, okay, how I wish I had access to these resources when I was a form six literature student. And everyone said it's brilliant presentations. So I think we, we by, uh, through your presentations, everyone see the relevance of literature as well as what Gill's database uh, could help uh, teachers as well as students to look at literature from another perspective is not another subject which is scary anymore because the numbers of students of taking uh, the Malaysian equivalent, SPM or equivalents of O levels examinations, the literature in English elective subjects has dropped again uh, last year. So hopefully, okay, by having the Gales databases, as well as all of us in this forum, we will be able to push it through. Let everyone knows that 
literature in English is not that scary. I think Gale uh, database will be able to play a major role with that. I think, well, with the officers in the Ministry of Education, if they see your presentation, I think that would be fantastic. I think, Keith, we should arrange, uh, well, Keith, to do a presentation for the, for the Ministry of Education in Malaysia. Yeah, so absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, Masaki, once again. So next, I would like to introduce the speaker is, uh, well, someone who most of us we are waiting for, uh, is the teachers who are in charge of the students' presentations that we watched just now from Sri KDU International uh, School. So let us welcome uh, Ms. Amelia Natasha Mohamed Jaffa. She is a drama and mathematics teacher in Sri uh, Sri Kuala Lumpur, Sri KL, sorry, not Sri KD, I'm so sorry. Sri Kuala Lumpur, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sri Dr. Chia, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Is Sri Kuala Lumpur International School, Malaysia. So once again, let us give a warm welcome to Amelia. Hello, assalamualaikum, and thank you for having me here today. Thanks for hanging out with us um, this lovely afternoon. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background about myself. Hello, my name is Amelia. I am from Sri Kuala Lumpur, <laughs> um, and I'm a mathematics and drama teacher. Now, I know what you guys are thinking, right? That's quite an unusual combo, um, but as you know, um, I was one of those people who was a science girl who was always creative and I loved literature and I loved reading and I loved writing poetry and I love art. And while my parents might have been heavily mixed at the core, they were still Asian. So um, you know which, sign, which stream I had to go to. I went to the science stream, but I was very, very fortunate that um, my whole life I was uh, exposed to a lot of great books and my dad always um, you know, encouraged us to explore ourselves through books. And um, because of my rich heritage, I actually found a lot of, um, I found a, a lot of pieces of home in, in literature, in poems written by um, children of diaspora, by uh, sons and daughters of immigrants. And I felt a sense of belonging because when you are so mixed, like I am, you kind of belong everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So I found a piece of home um, in those books, in those words. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, in order for me to understand my family, I basically uh, had to really do my research and dig up, you know, how did we get here and how did my parents, uh, my grandparents come here and what were they like, right? And essentially now I encourage my children, the students that I teach to do the same. So we discover ourselves. Um, how we all of your issues and who we are and and what we like and um, you know discover a little bit more about ourselves and share it with each other in the classroom and at this level um, I'm so blessed because Sri KL our drama um, curriculum is an in-house one so it gives me the flexibility and the fluidity to cater to children's needs and interests while building it up you know the the love for wanting to explore characters to explore storyline to explore um, literature as a whole and um, our aim actually is to build children's confidence to explore different means of expression whether it's poetry acting miming uh, videography and um, ma mainly to better understand themselves and the world around them so i hope to ex explain to you or break it down to you um, in in a very concise manner, I try, <laughs> um, uh, through these steps. So there are four steps. I will just share with you my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Is it presenting? Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, great, awesome. So there are four steps to what we do um, in drama. The first step, I will tell you that it is made out of respect. The second step out of trust the third step out of empathy and the fourth step out of courage. So um, please, without further ado, I will just explain to you step number one, creating a safe space. Now, 
my role as a teacher, whether I'm teaching drama or mathematics, is to pique interest and curiosity. I try to encourage this by holding a safe space for children to be expressive, to be opinionated, to say outrageously brilliant things. And our children, even though they are 10 or 9 or however old they are, they have so many things they want to share, so many ideas that they have. So I try and create this space for them so that they can learn to reflect and learn to um, discuss their their thoughts with other people with their peers so while we make a safe space for them to be opinionated i also make a space for them to make mistakes so that they can learn to make things right to be self-reliant and to be reflective individuals and as you know like studying drama um it can get quite intense because we're really diving into these characters and my mentor taught me that, you know, studying drama is the art of studying, of being human. And while that sometimes may require you to be critical, all the time we're being vulnerable. So I asked my students, what does a safe space mean? What does it mean to have a safe space to you? And they come and tell me, Miss Amelia, being in a safe space means being free from judgment, being able to express myself, being able to um, be who I want to be. Safety is freedom to me. And I understood that because I felt free when I was reading all those books that made me feel heard, that made me feel seen, that made me feel like I belonged somewhere, that someone out there understood me as well. So I wanted these children to have a, a space where they can completely express themselves. And while safety also means freedom, we also understand that, you know, we all come from different walks of life, different backgrounds, in fact. So we made a pact, me and my kids. Um, we understand that this space is sacred, that you and me and we together, we are here to grow. We are here to learn. We are each other's cheerleaders. And while it's, it takes a lot to perform, um, we are always there to support our own. And we are always the loudest to cheer each other on. And that's something that we've all um, established from day one. That's basically number one, lesson number one, we come in, we create the space already. All right, and then we go to step two, which is sharing our own it's personal experiences. Mine, sorry, don't mind Siri. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we share our own personal experiences. I'm very open with my students. I tell them about my experiences about spoken word poetry. I tell them about my um, experiences as a visual artist, as a teacher, and we, we, we share each other's experiences. And I, and I notice that it encourages them to share their own opinions. Like, oh, really, what's it like on stage? Or maybe they have questions that they want to ask me. And we're very open about that. And I tell them about the greatest story that I've ever heard of, which is of my grandmother, the woman who taught me of courage, the woman who taught me that, you know, we need to fight for the people that we love and um, about how I found her love letters and about how her love letters taught me so much about myself without even meeting her at this point of her life. And they will start telling me about stories about their grandparents. And it's really amazing to see that interaction um, happen because then everybody gets to know everybody on a deeper level to get to know each other's stories so that we can understand each other better. Um, and for example, we also have um, our experiences of how did we, how did we view something? So like one, one example would be, our students were talking and debating about, you know, whether or not Rose should have let Jack die in Titanic because, you know, we all know that there was enough space for her um, on that little raft. And, you know, we, we understand that, okay, maybe the character didn't want to share and how would that make us feel, you know? So those sharing of um, experiences gives way to how we form our own personal values and our own personal um, stories. And then we go on to step three, which is extending from what we know. Now, I usually get children to understand characters, deeper characters, through what they have already been exposed to. So we might go on to like some, something simple, like, um, you know, the Gruffalo and we understand that the mouse was very, um, you know, he was very cunning and he was very uh, manipulative. So then we, we talk about how from that 
nursery, you know, uh, kindergarten story, how it can evolve, evolve to something more. So besides also understanding characters, we also pull in the emotions that we know from past experiences. So like, for example, one of the greatest class discussions that I had was actually when we were discussing Sonnet 18. And one student told me, Miss Amelia, ew, I don't want to fall in love or get married. What is this? And um, I chuckled and I said, you know, I understand these are these are a bunch of 10 year olds. So I don't expect you to recite the poem like, um, like you were in love, but instead, can we remember the last time that we felt love and then they start telling me oh yeah you know my popo gave me this my best friend gave me that and my mom did this a hug and that was when they felt loved so i said okay now can we channel that love that you feel when we read this poem and you can see the beautiful transformation from at the start of the class, they're like, ew, love is so ew, you know, to something so soft and they were accessing that love that was caring, that was soft, that was gentle. And then they read the poem so eloquently. So that is what I mean when I say we're extending from what we know, not just characters, but also the emotions that they felt before, which leads me to my last, um, my last one, which is the creation of our own stories. And like I told you before, this is the one that takes courage. And it takes courage to be open. It takes courage to explore new things. It takes courage to tell your own story. So my students, they tell me, but Miss Amelia, I'm scared. And I tell them that's a good thing because it means that this is something important, this is something valuable to you. And you are head to head with your biggest fear. And all you need to do is access that courage that you have within you, take a deep breath and tell your story. And this is something that you can be proud of regardless of whether or not your performance is beautifully done or not. So um, the point is that you took a chance on yourself. And that is what I wanted to express um, to them or to tell them. And these are some of the things that they came up with, writing poetry. These are nine-year-olds, mind you, um, the depth in their stories. And also, you know, some of them creating their own scripts and making their own YouTube videos. Um, from what we get to class to something that is important and meaningful for them. So I hope to end this, um, this small talk that I had with you with a short poem that I wrote slash prose, um, which goes, I remember bedtime stories, stories about my childhood, stories about my father's childhood and about my grandparents, like how my paternal grandfather served the crown, but his mother tongue was Urdu and my grandmother was Chinese. She was one out of the 1.2 billion people who was born a Han, but did not speak a word of Mandarin. My students ask me, Miss Amelia, do you have a story to share? And I tell them the greatest classroom I've ever sat one, the one my grandmother created, made out of a kitchen table, four stools and a whiteboard. There my grandmother told me to cut French beans diagonally. She knew that holding a, hat, a knife at that angle was hard for me, but still she insisted, do, so I did. She means to teach me patience, that learning a new skill is part of surviving and a woman who knows how to handle her knife, she is powerful. Yes, things are hard at the beginning. And I tell my students this, you will feel awkward, but you don't give up. And just like how my grandmother didn't give up on me, I won't give up on you either. And since graduating my grandmother's classroom, I've built one of my own, made out of conversations and stories. And just like my grandmother's, I have no whiteboards. My classroom shifts and molds and breaks and bends. And one day we're learning to immortalize love through Shakespeare. The next day we are solving mysteries. And the next time you know it, we're diving into learning the Elvish language with Tolkien. But yes, we start from a safe space so that we can move towards our own individual journeys, finding our own voice so that by the end, we learn to tell our own stories. And I end this half prose, half poem with Noam Chomsky. Education must provide the opportunities for self-fulfillment. It can at best provide a challenging environment for the individual to explore in his own way. And I remind myself this, that I do not dictate, I facilitate the exploration, the possibilities, and the wonder of self-discovery. And as you might have gathered 
in my classroom, in our classroom, our learning is a mutual transaction because while they learn from me, I learn from them too. Thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amelia. So I think your presentations, everyone said is lovely, 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 love your presentations. And one of them I'm uh, saying that, oh, that Amelia, the energetic one, I, I wouldn't review who the person is. But I think, uh, I think most, of, uh, most of the comments are about uh, uh, your presentations. I think uh, one of them, I think Alicia said, in a safe place, there's no right or wrong. It's all open-mindedness and respect each other standpoint. Yeah, so uh, yeah. And I, yeah, that's the spoken uh, words, presentations at the end and congratulations. I really enjoy your, your, your work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Amelia, over to you, Keith. Yeah, we really love you. The, the way you present, I think your students will worship you and uh, be in love with you, actually. No wonder Sri Kel always have such a long waiting list to get to the school. Maybe I want to put my nephews or niece in. I'll get Dr. Chia to, to help me find a way to get into Sri Kel, yeah. So your students are so blessed to have you. So we really enjoy your presentation. Hope that uh, you can share more in other sessions as well. Thank you for joining the team. Now, the next person I'd like to introduce is a teacher from uh, Sabah Secondary School. Uh, none other than Lawrence Dumling. All right. When I first met Lawrence was in, uh, in the Melta conference. All the uh, senior people gathered together to say, hey, this is the teacher to watch. Up and coming superstar. She's very good. Uh, one of the young leaders, uh, happy, you know, uh, like the uh, Director General material or maybe Minister of Education material in the future. So the thing is that we are so happy to have her today. And uh, she can read poetry. She teaches with uh, zest and energy. She can also sing and dance. Maybe next time we can get her to sing a song for us. Very, very good singer. And uh, most of all, she's very dedicated and uh, well loved by her students. So, uh, Lawrence, over to you. Thank you so much, Kate. Wow. Um, too, too humble and I could accept that praise. But nonetheless, thank you so much for inviting me as well. And to Miss Amelia, you inspired me a two line uh, poem to you. <laughs> Miss Amelia, I have a story to sh show to one that of fear and yet choose to persevere. So uh, as for my presentations, yes, I am a um, secondary school teacher here in Sabah. I have been teaching for 13 years. And different from uh, Miss Emilia's experience, uh, from my background, right, so I'm not from English speaking background and I do not have quite big exposure to literature when I was young, but I love words. So one of my love languages is words. So I love to read. Uh, my early exposure to reading was uh, the Daily Express, the Sabah homegrown newspaper, because my father never missed buying a single copy of it. And the other one was, uh, thanks to my mom, I always love to tag along with her during her weekly uh, chit chat copy time with the aunties. So I would sneak out to a few blocks away to one of the bookstores and bought myself if I'm not mistaken, the title of the book was Lima Setawan. It was a Malay investigative novel, I would say. So it was in the series. So for me, that was my exposure to literature, I would say. Even in class, being silent, being obedient, not to question was the virtues to be in the teacher's good book. So I do not have that exposure. It's really lucky for students like in Amelia's uh, school, for example, to have that opportunity now to engage and express themselves because um, uh, in a very typical Asian culture, right, to speak up, in fact, there are three things that I always tell students as well. If you are to speak up, expect three things, judgment, question, and rejection. So that's uh, that's one of the threat. That's why the first thing that Ms. Emily emphasized as well is safe space. So how do we create that safe space? 
because during my growing up years in schools, I'm not quite being exposed to that until I'm so grateful that I got the chance to go out of Sabah for first time in my life for my uh, degree study in UPM. So I'm being exposed now. Before this, I was expected to keep silent, be obedient now and expected to speak in a community of English speaking people. Although intense that experience could be, but that was one of my most electrifying experience being a student, I would say, because that's where I witnesses, just like what Emilia said earlier, all the expressions and to engage in discussions, even to engage in that discussions. For this presentation, in hindsight, as I'm reflecting, what is it that makes me truly not just a, just a personal connection to literature for me? And <laughs> I remember being in Dr. Eswin class. Um, I couldn't remember what was it, but it's a literature class. So everyone who knows of Edwin, he's not the guy that you want to mess with. If you want to ask questions, you better think twice. If you want to answer him, you better have a good reason. So, so uh, during these classes, despite being intense, right, it triggered me because back then I was not the kind of person who have the courage even to speak. Issue of how internet makes human life more efficient. We talked about how internet exists so that we can have. Can we get okay, so to yeah. silence the mic? Uh, thank you so much. Okay, you can continue, mm -hmm. Lawrence. That is a very short advertisement. Yeah? And nonetheless, uh, during that session, during Dr. Eswin's class, I think that was really what I really wanted to bring back returning from my degree because during that discussion right, I remember I was sitting there at the corner of the room looking at them Dr. Edwin and some of my cosmetics who are fluent in English can engage in very deep conversation about the literature material and I was there sitting at the corner like I have something to say in my heart I just couldn't get it out I just couldn't raise my hands I want to I have to be part of the discussion and that really truly sticks with me. I didn't realize that until the third year of my teaching experience, I followed what I've been taught in teaching my students in secondary schools. And I began to see that something isn't working. They are silent, they are obedient, but the kind of obedience is not the kind of obedience where during our time, that kind of obedience is kind of like a, a rebellion. They're just something that they wanted to say but they choose not to so i couldn't get my hand on it what is it until in 2013 a form for student of mine we had this very great presentation and we have a lot of q a i just let them ask any questions to their friends presenting and i asked uh, sabrina sabrina can you see that why wouldn't your students not you Friends ask questions when teachers are teaching. Never been trained to ask questions. So it stayed with me. Um, that is why when I when I ponder upon what she said, that's where I began to shift my gear from me talking to them sharing. So I pick up what Dr. Elson did. It's a much more lighter vibe, um, more on questioning to create that interactional space for them, and also when whatever contribution from the students, especially when it comes to literature, it's open to interpretations, like what Mr. Masaki earlier said, it's open to interpretations. But how do we shape the students' interpretation that they would feel encouraged, acknowledged, and eager to contribute more? Not just about what they say, but also listening to their friends. So these are the soft skills that, that is quite hard even to to teach more so to apply. I learned this um, because uh, I, uh, I learned this because thanks to a senior of mine who introduced me to Toastmaster Club. Now Toastmaster Club is where I've been taught applied how to give, how to accept and give critical evaluation. When you eager to hear criticism because you want to improve. So throughout my years training in that club, that's where I began to see, hey, this is something that we can bring into the classroom. And that's where slowly I'm proud to be named um, Miss Y 
from some of my students because they know I always ask questions. Alicia, thank you for bearing with me. Huh? The two years you're with me. <laughs> and But that's where the change is that I, that I will say. And literature, that is the context where the students can really a bit complex thinking and they have the chance to affect decision making i feel it is much more important to know how we demonstrate to them how we navigate in this vulnerable yet rich diverse interpretations of everyone and literature i would say the best context to do that and because of that um I feel the changes in my students as the years goes by and the success stories, I would say, I would not say this is a success stories. I would say these are inspirational stories that keep me as a teacher going to what I believe in to really empower, like the tagline for Gail, to empower change, to really to empower the students. And for example, as a student of mine, uh, Wong, she was very, he was very quiet in the class. I relieved his class once. He was very good in drawing. So I approached him. There was a good one. Can, oh, can you show it? So he slowly closed his book and retreat. Okay. I think I did not, I was supposed to do that. So I'm so lucky to be his English teacher for the, for the last two years of uh, secondary school. And we were glad that we were able to materialize his dream. His dream was, in fact, to present in front of the class to tell his silent struggles. Some students might want it to be, you know, A's and all, but some students just want to be up there and express themselves. And all the whole class just support him for that. Or even, uh, or even uh, two students of my region and Elaine, uh, they were very absorbed in the literature work that we do. For example, the Form 5 novel. Uh, Mr. Uh, Captain Nobody, or even the poem, uh, The Poison Tree. It's so dark, or why is it for the form five? But that's the opportunity for us to really question some of these uh, perspectives with the students. But these two girls, they really make me think, right? Uh, when, they, when I ask them to, to present or to share their thoughts, as they were saying, even as they were reciting the poem, they started crying. And the whole class just stayed quiet. So I approach them and I give her a hug and I said, it's okay if you want to stop here, we can continue later on. It's okay. But then she said to me, Miss Lawrence, I want to continue. And then upon, upon letting them express it, then they said, why? Because that literature content itself addresses mental health issues. And then that, that poison, uh, the poison tree itself talks about the difficulty that she has in friendship. So it, it, it really, I would say as a teacher, I think I would say that one of my, I would, I would give myself a, a pat in the back if I would able to make even one single student to do that in front of everyone. So just like what Mr. Masaki's uh, final quote, I'm really, really inspired by that, especially when it says that, you know, it teaches us to speak with eloquence and rigor and the weakening of our freedom, then we must act more so that we must read. And the materials that we read matters even more. Which materials that contain the most humanness in its context itself? It's literature. I hope you begin to question whatever they read as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity and back to you, Kit. Well, Lawrence, uh, thank you for sharing. It's really nice. Uh, do continue to inspire and keep up the good work and uh, continue to bless your students and they in turn will bless many, many. Okay, over to you, Wake Up. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. Well, finally meet again <laughs> across the sea. Yeah. So, um, Thank you so much. So if we hear 
uh, Amelia is creating a safe space for students. I think uh, Lawrence used literature to give students a platform, a tool to express themselves, to connect to the literature even further and indirectly use it uh, to be a resource to develop them personally as well as professionally. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for your sharing as well as the lovely stories that you have about your students. Yeah, that's really touched, I think, all of us who are teachers. So the next speaker that I would like to invite is from another perspective. He's a researcher on literature, teaching literature. In fact, I believe uh, her, uh, her research uh, focused on the literature teaching in Malaysia. So let us welcome Dr. Grace Lim Chia Wei from uh, Faculty of Education, a senior lecturer uh, from University of Malaya. Thank you, Wei Kiong. Um, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be the first speaker who does not respond with a poem because I, I, that was one part of the creative writing expression that I have not explored as much. I did a bit in university, but I think my interests lie elsewhere. So as Wei Kiong uh, introduced me just now, I am with the Faculty of Education, University of Malaya. Uh, so when I was invited to be part of this group, I was very excited. Any opportunity to talk about literature in Malaysia, I will grab it. So uh, carrying on from uh, Amelia, who, who spoke about how literature can be used in primary school context, Lawrence in the secondary school context, I will touch a bit on STPM, Form 6 or an A-level, it's equivalent, before talking about what literature is in uh, universities, because that was part of my research as well. So... Personally, my first experience with literature was in Form 6. I wanted to study it for Form 5. Could not find a teacher, could not find a class. So I had to forego my ambition at a point of time, even though it was a subject I was really looking forward to, so I couldn't take it. At Form 6, um, I, through my mom, who contacted NPM, we managed to find a tutor, and thus uh, began my journey with literature and English. I want to make the distinction here because uh, when I talk about literature, I, I, I refer to the school elective that's offered at SPM and STPM level mainly because to many students, or to me when I was reading as I was growing up, I love reading, I read a lot, but to me it was reading. You know, so the, the term literature was abstract to me. It was something I would see when I go to the bookshop and I look at a particular rack that has all the penguin covers, all the titles, all in the same kind of, of binding, uh, at the top, literature. So I thought, okay, so this must be literature. All the books I find in that series is literary. So my... It took me a while to realize this, and upon reflection on me, I realized that I had uh, become biased or influenced, really, in how I conceptualize what literature is. Because if you grow up reading only Annie Blyton, and for me, then I graduated to the Bronte sisters, loved Tolkien, and that whole world of literature, that was what I thought it was. And the boundary was like that, that type. Going into Form 6, we had two papers, British and other writers, uh, so it was Shakespeare and other writers. So it was uh, writers like Shakespeare, as mentioned, Jane Austen and uh, all the names like Wordsworth, Blake, Coleridge, all of these names were there. And that connected to me because I thought that was the future. I was like, ah, this is what I wanted to study and I'm so glad I'm studying it. I enjoyed it. The Paper two was called uh, New Literatures in English or something like that, or Literatures from Other Parts of the World. And it included texts uh, from India, from the West Indies. Um, there was definitely a Malaysian text in there. And the sad part is, I remember still now, 
that when I was studying the text for those papers, for that particular paper, I thought to myself, why am I reading this? I don't, in, I don't like this as much as I do the British writers. Why am I reading about uh, Muammar Haji Saleh? Why am I reading his poetry when I much more would enjoy Wordsworth or Blake? I'm just sharing that this was my experience going up. Yeah, that was my SCPM experience. Still, I read it, analyzed it, did whatever I was supposed to do with it. And then I went to uni. It was at uni level and later on through research when I look at narratives of other students who reflected the same kind of idea, like Malaysian literature is not fun. Like why uh, we should only be reading like Jane Austen. So I asked the student, if you could design your literature classroom, what do you want it to look like? Anything you want. She said, I want a big armchair and a nice fireplace in a drawing room that looks like Jane Austen's house. That shows you how much her idea of what literature is, is really influenced by that, that, that canonical view of literature. So then I made it a point to, with my own students to get them to understand that what they think literature is, is based on what they have in, what they have seen and experienced and heard of in the world around them. For me, growing up, it was that one bookshelf of Penguin books. Basically, right? If it's not published in Penguin, I was like, this is not literature. Okay, it was at that to that level. Uh, that one shelf that to me was literature and Shakespeare. So I had to break that down. I had to get them to realize, okay, let's talk about this. What is literature? And then uh, from that as a baseline, we explore and we break down the biases that we have created. And it's, it's a, it's, it can be so, it's subconscious, you know, like we want our students to read good books, great books. And more often than not, these are books that have been recognized and are entrenched in the literary heritage. Uh, in my literature research, right? If you compare a 1956 syllabus of literature in English for A level, what was what was uh, known as HSC, High School Certificate, 1956, you compare it to the syllabus now. A lot of the texts are the same text. So, in Malaysia, what MPM did with STPM Lit in incorporating Asian works of literature non-Western works of literature was to challenge that idea, was to get students to read texts that they would not normally pick out from the bookshop. So texts from R.K. Narayan, from Naipaul. Yeah, uh, who was my West Indies one? Uh, it was the, the one who wrote, John Reese, uh, John Reese, who did White Sagasso Sea. But that's like the prequel to Charlotte Bronte's uh, Jane Eyre. Okay, so when the syllabus required us to read those texts, then we read them. So a lot of what literature is, uh, I think in Malaysia, we have to understand, a lot of what literature is, is influenced by the curriculum, by the syllabus. And that's why it's a very powerful tool when it comes to shaping and guiding students as they learn what it what literature is. So uh, yeah, so at, at A level, I I taught A level for a while, and like Amelia and uh, Lawrence, right? My favorite class was this. I went in. I was teaching Life of Pi, we and uh, Yan Mato, with the students. I went in and I asked one question: Which is the real story? And the rest of that one hour, I didn't have to say a word because the students were just going off each other. No, no, this is the story. No, wait, what do you mean by story? Let's talk about what the story is. So they, as uh, a student studies literature, once they move past the, uh, to, to, to the, to, uh, I guess, pre-U and university level, the questions that are asked are 
different. Uh, they, they shift a little bit. We focus then on the genres, the underlying uh, conventions of the genre. Why is it such? We look, talk about contextual um, writing, the right context of production and context of reception. So this is where like, uh, like Gail, the Gail, uh, uh, what is that? the Gail learning, Gail liter literature comes into play because you need all this extra information to help you to help inform your understanding of the text. So that's what happens at uni level. Now at uni, and I, I touch, I go back to what uh, Ramesh said in the very beginning. Why is it that so few students take literature? Yeah. So at university level, I encounter students who study Tesla. They've never done literature aside from the component. And the component that was taught to them was, this is the answer. If the, if the question asks you, which is your favorite character? These are the character, these, are the, these, are, these two are your choices and each, there are three points that you have to write. You know, so that's the way that they were taught what literature was. So I have experience engaging with these students and getting them to really know. Literature is much broader than that. And because I teach texts like Merchant of Venice, uh, picking up from Emilia and Lawrence's point, you get, it's a safe space because, and it's a safe space to discuss issues that are considered controversial because it is one step removed. You, when they talk about uh, things like maybe, uh, Hmm, incest, for example, yeah, or or uh, January, May, and marriages, that kind of thing. When they discuss it in civics class, for instance, they are talking about real people, real situations. But when you, when it comes to a literature class and a literature text, a discussion about it, it's like, oh, this character is so so and so, that character is so and so. So there is safe, uh, there is a safe space there because they are not commenting about real people, that gives them a bit more freedom to say, okay, but in this world, it's like this. Then as the teacher, we have the joy really of getting them to make that link. Okay, so in this world, it's like this. Now, let's look at that aspect and see. Do you see that in your world around you? And then they start to realize, oh, wow. Okay, so we've, we've, made, all this, uh, we've made all these evaluations about the character in that world. And it actually reflects what we are experiencing. Yeah. So thank you for the bell. I hear it. So I uh, just wanted to end with, I think literature as a school subject teaches us not only to express ourselves as I cannot say it any better than the present presenters before me, but it teaches us how to read. It teaches us a new way of reading. It teaches us a way to analyze and it teaches us how to come up with an informed interpretation, informed by the perspectives of others, informed by the works before us. So uh, yeah, that's it. All right, so thank you, Ikeam. Uh, that's all uh, for now. I hope I didn't ramble on, but yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh... Grace. I think, yes, it's true. I think the tax selections is something, an interesting uh, topics to discuss and continuingly be uh, something, a topic that we will be exploring, uh, well, in the Ministry of Education with the teacher. <laughs> okay, now let's look at some of the comments online. Uh, yeah, so many of them talk about uh, yeah, the text as well, okay, as well as, yeah, well, thank you for your uh, presentation, Grace, so these are the comments that I've got online over here, and I think uh, most importantly, what we need to do is continuing to promote literature so that more people will see the values. Uh, I think uh, you talk about how it connects to students uh, post SPM. How do they deal with it? And I think students, all our students, in fact, they are ready to deal with, uh, well, the life of Pi, such a classic uh, piece of work. 
personally. Yeah, thank you so much. So over to you, uh, Keith. Hi, thank you, Grace. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I think for the literature people, right, you guys who taught the university are the paling atas people who, who is teaching literature. Uh. I, I think the, a product like Gale would really, really help your, your students and your community in uh, bringing literature to a much higher level. And the things that I do identify with you that's about, about penguin books and so on. I mean, teachers every month, uh, they love reading so much, they keep buying books until it's always not enough budget <laughs> as such. I think what we do is that you mark every speaker that spoke today or the committee member who appear on screen today, you mark them. What I'm going to do is that they will be the people who are going to add you to the to WhatsApp group for all literature teachers. And those of you who are added into the WhatsApp group, right, I will give you a special VIP card where every day is birthday. You don't need to wait for your birthday or anniversary. Every day you can buy all the penguin and stuff books at wholesale rates. So every day is a celebration day. So mark your speakers, make sure you get to know them. If you can't find them or can't connect them, go to LinkedIn, go to Facebook, get in touch with them so that they can add you in. But first of all, you must be a teacher. Okay. All right. The next person I would like to uh, introduce is... Uh, Miss uh, Ama Shoba Shana, actually, frankly, all of you have to thank her for initiating this literature hangout, actually. All right. We invited her to be the speaker for inspiring teachers. And uh, the board of directors of the organizing committee in the in, from the MOE and from Cambridge from us, everybody nominated her to be the speaker for inspiring teachers. But she says that my real passion is in literature, all right? It's just like some guys tells me, they drink so much of Guinness stout that when they donate blood, Guinness stout comes out of, of, of them. But when you deal with uh, Shoba, she has so much literature, she can spill literature. And then the things that if she's Spider-Man, she'll shoot literature out of her veins. <laughs> so over to you, Shoba. <laughs> we looking forward to hear from you. <laughs> Uh, you're muted, Shoba. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, fine. So, thank you, Keith. Very lovely introduction. And hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I must say, Arigato gozaimasu to Masaki for mentioning that article on premature uh, obituary because it reminded me of Ray Bradbury's novel, Fahrenheit 451. And I would also like to thank you, Keith, because you talked about romancing with literature. And basically that is what I'm doing with literature. It's a perpetual romance with literature. And I must share with you how and what literature means to me. It's, you're right, Keith, it's in my blood. Even if you were to drain the blood away, it will still be there in my bones where literature is concerned. You know, just let me share a few things with you. Why I love literature. It is timeless and it is borderless. And I think Masaki also mentioned that there is no age where literature is concerned. It doesn't age, it's always there. And you know what? You cannot divorce reality from literature. You can't. Literature is about drama, not the genre of drama, but about the drama in life. And life is about drama. There's no way you can kind of go through life without having an iota of literature in your blood. Let me give you a few episodes. Okay. Number one, I remember when I was in India and we were in this train journey and we were passing fields and fields of yellow flowers. So I got so excited and I told my sister, 
Hey, you've got daffodils. Look, look, look. It's so beautiful. Daffodils. Then she turned to me and she said, you gilaga. That is sawi. I said, what? Sawi. You know our vegetable sawi? Because the sawi has got those yellow flowers on top. And from a distance, I thought it was daffodils because of words. Oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. And then that was one episode. The other episode, um, The Road Not Taken, the poem, The Road Not Taken. I remember I'd gone to Kundasang to give a workshop on, the, at that time, it was the literature component. So it was so beautiful. Our venue was uh, at Hotel Kundasang, very cool, lovely, and it was misty. And outside the window, there was this track where it actually diverged. So I called all of them. I said, come, 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 come to the window, look. And I said, two roads diverged in a yellow road. And I took the road less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. They looked at me. Yala, we understand. And if you connect literature or that poem with reality, it's so very interconnected because of the choices, the decisions we make in life. You can't divorce reality and literature. One last example on poetry, the poison tree, which Lawrence mentioned earlier. Uh, I, I, it actually rekindled a chord in, in me because I remember the time when I had a lot of anger within me against a friend. And I did not share the anger with a friend. And I lost my friend. And the poison tree is actually about that repression of anger. So it actually evokes a lot of memories. Fine. Let's go to Kill a Mockingbird, one of my favorite novels. I remember there's a particular uh, statement given by Atticus Finch when he said, you will never know a person until you climb into his skin and walk around in it, which is so very true. We will never understand a person until we know what circumstances he is in until we are in his shoes and wearing his shoes and knowing what problems he has. That is reality. Talk about shots. Oh, wait, hold on. Um, Mockingbird, one more. Something about courage. Courage is when you know you are licked beforehand, but you still do it. Although you know you are licked and you will finish it. That to me is the meaning of real courage. Those are all the lessons we get about life from literature. Tell me, how can literature ever be boring? Tell me, waiting for Godot, if you look at it. Oh God, I kept on waiting and waiting and waiting. But there's a lesson to be learned. Sometimes things are not what they appear to be. You just keep on waiting forever, but maybe sometime in the future when Beckett re-emerges, he might want to write Waiting for God or Part 2. So you might have a settled issue there. Okay. And okay, short stories. I too love short stories. There's always a twist at the end. For example, we talk about The Landlady by Roald Dahl. There's a twist at the end. You would never, ever know about a kind lady becoming a serial killer. Can you imagine that? But this is what happens in life. You can never judge a book by its cover. There's so many, I, I can just go on and on by looking at the clock, which is next to my computer. And the last one, dramatization. Okay, I will talk about that later. No, I think I better talk about it now. Okay. Traumatization. And you know, I am thoroughly, 
thoroughly addicted to madness. Thoroughly. It's got all the issues of life. Okay, let me give you a few issues, a few themes, and you can relate it to our Malaysia and other countries. Okay, you've got love, power, lust, revenge, corruption, murder. What else do you want? You've got everything. I remember Serena in one of my conversations with her, she said something like this. Literature shouldn't be within the pages of a book. It should be lifted out of the book. It should be, it should be transported to the students. It's not supposed to be contained without a book. And that's what literature does. It brings us to life. And life is about drama. Okay, one last thing. Okay. One last one. About novels, I forgot. Lord of the Flies, which is something that I think the it's young adult literature, and I think children would love it. There's one particular line, if I'm not mistaken, it goes something like, Ralph wept for the end of innocence, the darkness in man's heart. We all have that darkness. Every one of us is whether we allow it to emerge or not. Now, is that not reality? Now, tell me, how can I not love literature when it is about life and it's timeless? Now, I better go back, go to my second part about its um, involvement with the teacher training institute. Now, very, very quickly. Um, I think if you want to bring uh, the meaning of literature and passion to the students in the institutes, you've got to show them, you've got to share with them the beauty of language and the beauty of literature. For example, one way we can do it is what we did. And it's not I, okay, not I, it's we. We as a team did it. Uh, and we worked it through our coursework. What we did was, uh, for example, for poetry, we told them we want, uh, apart from the linear, normal assignments, we said we like to have a graphic representation of the poem. So tell us, uh, and it was an A4 sized piece of paper. I, they had to laminate it. So, no words, we, we told them, try not to have any words, but just pictures. And after that, we would have an oral presentation of five minutes for you to explain why you've chosen those images plus, for example, colors. So I remember there's a poem called uh, a Suicide Note by Janice Miriki Tani. And this particular group of three, actually had a picture of just pure white snow with a bloodied dead bird, crimson in color, bloodied on the snow. That was all, but it was pregnant with meaning. The impact was there. It was fantastic. And the oral pre presentation of Kosla, we had, I mean, um, grammatical errors, etc. But they actually got to the root of the poem. It was fantastic. Okay, the next one. To kill a mockingbird, what we did. We said, okay, we would like you to give us a newspaper front page. Okay, and it's got to be an A3 sized paper, laminated, and you have got Put in what you think is important. We didn't tell them, the teachers or the lecturers did not tell them what they had to use. So it was up to them to create that newspaper cover. And they did it. And we were fascinated. Not only did we give, did they give uh, like muted colors, they even use different fonts for the newspaper headline, for the name of the publication. And the date was also 1904. 
etc. You see? Fantastic! And the articles that were there, it was group work because we believed in collaborative learning and we also wanted them to discuss, well, discuss among themselves as to what they would think are the significant events of uh, within the novel and to project it onto the newspaper. So that's what they did. They discussed, they discussed, they picked, they selected, and then they had to do a little write-up about why they picked those particular articles. I tell you, it was, I think, one of the best assignments that we had given, and I think the lecturers all enjoyed marking it. And everyone got an A because it was so wonderful. And it gave us, the lecturers, an insight into what they understood to be the theme, to be the important, significant events in the play. Uh, sorry, in the novel. So assessment is important. Be creative so that they can also understand your passion, which will be given to them so that they are passionate about the work that they do. It's not just a plain assignment. It's part of them. And lastly, my Macbeth. Okay. I will share this with you. We had dramatization. This is a real episode. And I think one of the guests may be able to share a little bit more. So they had to dramatize the scene. So these students were staying in a condo. And they dramatized the scene about... Uh, uh, Macbeth, Macduff discovering uh, uh, Duncan. Duncan is a king. Macduff is his loyal subject. So Macduff discovered that Duncan had been murdered. So the students were practicing. So one of the guys said, murder, murder, treason, murder. And you know what happened? The residents in the condo came to the balconies because they thought something dastardly was happening. They thought a murder was taking place. Can you imagine? Oh my God, that was so fantastic. I can never forget that episode. And I told the students, oh, for you, very good. You must have impressed them. Okay, and what last, last, before Professor Tu rings the bell. You know the witches? You know what they did for their costumes, this particular group? The dustbin bags, the, the, the black trash bags. What they did was they cut it up and they used it as clothes. So can you imagine with the dim atmosphere, with the fans on, these bags were actually billowing under the fan. And when they moved, they made this swishing sound and it sounded so ominous. And these students were bent over like witches, just bent over like that and swishing and swishing. Such a cheap costume, but one of the best I have ever seen in my tenure as a lecturer. So basically, for the, this is what we did at the Teacher Training Institute, and we can actually play around with the coursework and show them what beauty there is in literature. I mean, of, of course, apart from the language, the issues, the themes, and how it is related to them. This is what we did. And I hoped it made an impression on them. Anyway, we enjoyed it. Just imagine being paid to do what you enjoy for you. That's heaven. I think my time is up. I'm looking at the clock now. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Shaba. Each time we see you, we love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you who have been taught by Shoba, aren't you so lucky or so blessed? <laughs> All right. Now the, the thing is that uh maybe what we should do is that when you get your hands 
or on the Gale literature thing, make sure you study thoroughly, maybe two books like Macbeth or To Kill a Mockingbird. We may actually have a Macbeth hang hangout the next time or To Kill a Mockingbird hangout the next time with Shoba. But I think probably something that I think a lot of uh, relevance to everybody that teaches literature, you may actually look into the key titles for SPM or SDPM. I don't know whether Macbeth is one of the chosen titles for SPM or SDPM. And we probably have a discussion on that. Who knows, maybe all our students will get A for SPM for the coming exams. Then we will really revive literature all over again and, and get interest. And frankly, right, sometimes we should, we, should, we should get a science student to do literature. I was so lucky when I was in a science stream last time in MBS KL, five science one and five science two, we get to choose one art subject, either you do accountancy or you do literature. And all of us science students who did literature, our life is transformed. Every movie, every song, every picture we see because we have done literature before, we get more value than anybody else who watched that same movie. So this is exactly uh, teachers that inspire like Shoba does to us and change our lives. Thank you, Shoba. Over to you, Wei-Kyung. Thank you. Yeah, in the chat, everyone said said hi to you, Shoba. So I think mm -hmm. in the Facebook and all this, so everyone still say Fuyo, Miss Shoba. So everyone <laughs> feel your energy. Yeah. All right. So the next speaker uh, is Miss <laughs> Karina Salim, Deputy Director of Services and Multilateral Relations Sector, Private Education Division. Ministry of Edu uh, Education, Malaysia. I think, well, later on when she share her experience with you, you know her relation with literature. So over to you, Ms. Arena. Thank you, Dr. Tu. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so, wow. Thank you, Shoba. You know, <laughs> you, you're not only an inspiration to your uh, teacher trainees, I, did, I didn't have the pleasure of uh, being tutored by Ms. Shoba, but I've had the privilege of working with her and it's a pleasure. And I think together we have uh, tried yeah, to, to make some changes uh, with literature uh, education in Malaysia, which I will share in a while. Um, also, um, lovely to hear you again, Amelia. Um, we had her when I was in ELTC uh, sharing her spoken word with us. Um, Lawrence, thank you for being a dedicated secondary school teacher. Yeah, um, we need more teachers like you all. And Grace, thank you for pointing out what else needs to be done with literature education in Malaysia. Okay, so it all falls back to the Ministry of Education, right? Um, you've talked about uh, the text chosen, yeah, teacher training, uh, it all has to come together, correct? Um, but I think um, uh, I will talk about my experience in uh, the uh, curriculum development division, yeah, uh, because that was where uh, we kind of like started looking at changing the text. Um, at that time, there was discussion about the big L and the small L. Then we were told there's no such thing as the big L and the small L. Literature is literature, right? And we totally agree, yeah? Um, uh, so what we did um, in 2007, um, we did a little um, needs analysis, right? We went around asking teachers and students um, what they liked about the, their current text at that time and what they didn't like. So at that time, the texts were things like um, uh, Dead Crow, Lies, Brief, Scandal. Yeah, I think you all will remember, some of you might remember that. So when we, when we interviewed some students, it was very interesting. There was one from one boy. He says, I am 13, right? I am 13. And you're telling me to read things like Lies, Brief, Candle. You're telling me to read things like Dead Crow. I don't want to die, I want to live, right? So that was one example. And, I, and, and we were thinking like, yeah, you know, uh, makes sense. Uh, so what we did was um, 
in that survey, uh, a lot of them had a lot to say. So this particular boy who made that statement, we, for the very first time in 2007, uh, and thanks to our bosses who agreed, we had students actually being on the evaluation panel of the text, right? And um, it was very unheard of, very difficult concept for many people within the ministry to accept because, because like you're choosing for the children. So why are you asking the children to come and read and choose the text, right? We are the ministry, we are the teachers. We tell them what to read, right? So we said that, mm, no, I think it's time to change. We have to start listening to our children, right? And listening to our teachers. Um, so we, um, we started, uh, as usual, we followed the process. Uh, publishers submitted their books, right? The only thing that was different was that we had a team of teachers and we had a team of students sitting together, right, in a hotel and reading the same books. And they had to evaluate them individually. And then we had literally had a debate, right? Students said, we like this book and the teachers said, we like this book. So the teachers would ask, why do you want this book? That's not good for you to learn, you know? It's not the kind. And they said, yeah, but it relates to me, right? Um, I can see myself in it. And I think that resonates with what most of you have said, that you cannot separate reality from literature, right? So um, uh, I would like to share some of the, the titles. Uh, Kashwini, if we can just go to the last slide or second last slide with the titles. Yeah, so we had very different texts selected uh, during that time, yeah, that year. So like the first one is a short story, right? Even by looking at it, how do you pronounce the title? Yeah, so uh, students said, this is fun, right? So they tried uh, Q, W, T, U, E, O, right? Um, and after a lot of discussion, they said, teacher, do you know uh, this is the top line of the, uh, of the keyboard, right? Quirtio. And some teachers said, no, it's not. You know, uh, this is a silly title for a story. And students said, no, if you really read it, you know, it's so funny. And students could see the humor in it. Yeah, it's, it's about um, uh, how this typewriter is uh, uh, finally possessed by the, the previous secretary, right? So it types on its own, it does things, yeah? It's a date secretary according to Majida, yeah. It was a date secretary, okay? Uh, gulp and Gasp, right? Gulp and Gasp uh, was one of the plays with Rumpelstiltskin. So Rumpelstiltskin is uh, very um, uh, popular, right? People know it, so that was okay. But Gulp and Gasp was... Um, there was an issue with it because um, the cover had the, uh, the character wearing purple underpants on the outside, right? And, and, uh, the, and it was an issue. So we said, why? Superman wears underwear on the outside, right? And students know Superman. So what's wrong with Gulp and Gas? And I tell you, Gulp and Gas has fantastic vocabulary. One of my favorite lines was, um, uh, Lord Septic says, you know, tonight is an F night, right? An F night? So the students who actually read the text picked that out and the teacher said, of course you would pick things like that out, right? Uh, and they said, yeah, but teacher, we didn't realize there's so many F words, yeah? It's a filthy night. It's a foggy night. It's a frosty night, right? So uh, vocabulary, yeah, words. Uh, literature is about learning about other cultures. Yeah, so with it being frosty and foggy, yeah, uh, you are actually learning about the culture. But then again, you're building your vocabulary. Um, how I met myself, um, how I met myself was about someone who met someone else who looked like him. 
right? And students got excited because for the first time, they came across this word doppelganger, which was in Harry Potter. Yeah? And Harry Potter is a big thing with teenagers and kids and adults, you know? Uh, I watch it every year, a whole go, season one to season seven, yeah? Um, so um, things that are relatable to them is what Lauren said, you know? Um, step by Wicked Step is about seven kids who come from very different backgrounds. Uh, some come from broken homes, some come from single parents, um, uh, some uh, uh, have uh, both parents, but who do not love each other. Um, there's a kid who is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, only has um, one parent who died, right? So seven kids with very different backgrounds come together and um, they share their stories. And a lot of our students relate to those from different perspectives, okay? Um, Flipping Fantastic is about twins. One is in a wheelchair and one who is able-bodied, right? And how um, the brother in the wheelchair excels in his own way and the able-bodied brother excels in his own way, right? And they're all very relatable, very, very relatable to our children. So I think um, uh, we need to start thinking about um, our readers, you know? Kids today don't like reading. I don't know how many of you will agree, but uh, that's the trend, right? And why don't they like to read? Probably because the text is not exciting to them. I remember when we asked for, for uh, recommendations, yeah? Uh, no offense, but top, uh, books like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, right? Macbeth were suggested right, for our Form 1s to Form 5s. And we said, no, no, we need to move away because what we want is for them to love literature, for them to start reading. And that was the year as well, we started introducing um, graphic novels, yeah? Because from year 6 to Form 1, for you to suddenly just give them a novel uh, is quite challenging. So we thought graphic novels would be a good um, uh, bridge. Yeah, uh, and Shoba, I remember Shoba was so excited. Yes, graphic novels. I've been wanting this for ages, she said, right? And we finally got them in. Um, so we got um, still very uh, literary-based texts, things like the railway, uh, the railway Children, no, Around the World in 80 Days, Black Beauty, and Journey to the Center of the Earth, right? So, but they were in a graphic novel form. They were colorful, right? And children enjoyed reading, coming to Form 1. So I think we need to start rethinking, right? So that's on the text part. Um, teacher training, but who makes it all come to life? The teachers, right? So we do uh, hope that teachers will, will um, be like Miss Shoba, or maybe we can have extra classes from Miss Shoba. Yeah, um, we have teachers like Lawrence and Amelia who already have that passion in them, right? Uh, who are already making sure uh, students um, understand what literature is. Yeah, literature is about living it. Literature is about soaking it. Um, we actually suggested something different to use the lyrics of a song as a literature text because um, in other countries, one of the most popular songs being used as a literature text is Imagine. Yeah. And if you really look at the word, it means a lot. Thank you, Dr. Tu. Yeah, it really means a lot. So um, uh, those in the position, I'm no more with Curriculum Development Division. Um, but we hope that uh, whoever has the opportunity to give feedback, yeah, um, to take these things into consideration when you are, uh, when you are selecting the text. Um, 
And one more thing that I want to add is that in the US and in the UK, to do medicine, you need to do literature. Yeah, because literature connects you. Yeah, literature um, uh, fosters tolerance, right? Uncertainties. So all these put together um, has to reflect, yeah, has to be reflected in the text we use, in the way teachers approach literature in the classroom, yeah, which I'm sure after this, Gladys will pick up on. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Serena. Thank you so much. I think it's always uh, good to have the insights from the ministry to tell us what's going on. Um, I think sometimes we, we heard a lot of rumors when it comes to the tax selections. So I think that is something that I, I, I think by listening to what you have presented, I think the, the teachers as well as the parents will appreciate it because we know that uh, the Malaysian uh, Ministry of Education because um, is sometimes in a difficult position because they not only need to consider uh, urban school, but they also need to, to make sure that uh, our children, our students in rural or Kawasan Pedalaman, they will be able to enjoy the knowledge as well as the text that we work with everyone. So text selections is a challenge. And I really hope that, okay, uh, there will be more bottom up approach like Ms. Arina, you, you shared with us, that is fantastic. And if it's, it's continue, I think it will be good for all the teachers and hopefully more takers for SPM and STPM literature elective module. That is, I think our main, okay, push for all of us in the teacher institutions and university. Thank you so much once again, Serena, I mean, Serena. So yeah, thank you so much. Everyone appreciate your insight. So over to you, Kit. Yeah, actually I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the people in the Ministry of Education, especially the CDC as well, they work so hard. I, I actually have the pleasure of working with the team once. Like uh, like fixing the book. I think I think form four, or form five, sing to the dawn. Do you know they have to cater for such a wide array of user? Even the cartoon or the picture in the book, uh, if they don't have long sleeve uh, and show too much flesh, uh, we're gonna redo all the picture and dress them up. If you have the hand, you can't see five fingers. You're gonna make sure that they have five fingers, or else you don't even show any hand or finger at all. So the thing is that there's so much to coordinate. In fact, I think for those of you who are expert in teaching, say, a, a specific textbook, say, for example, Sing to the Dawn, we may actually do like kind of a public lecture where you get celebrity trainer or teachers like you all to do a nationwide uh, lecture, public lecture on that specific textbook. And probably we may even get the, the the speaker, I mean the author herself, like Ho Ming Fong, the, the, the author who wrote Sing to the Dawn. We may actually invite her to actually be one of the presenters. What is the original intention of writing the book from the culture of uh, somebody giving up the, <laughs> the seat to, a, to, a, to the brother just because it's male or something like that, right? So it can be something really interesting. We can actually do a a huge, huge lecture for the whole country if you learn to do that. That can be a consideration uh, for the MOE to, to think about, all right, to help the students appreciate the text better, especially when the author is still alive. All right, uh, we shall introduce the next speakers. Uh, Ms. Gladys uh, Francis Joseph, she's a school improvement specialist. Wow, this is the first time I heard about uh, a role like this must be really, really, really super smart people to be appointed or, or to be taking on this role. So we're very excited and very eager to hear from you, Gladys. So over to you, Gladys. Thank uh, you thank for joining you. us. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Okay, um, it, it, is, it is really inspiring listening to all of you here. 
um, all literature enthusiasts and with different perspectives and so on. I'm so I'm humbled to be here to share my experience with you all. Um, what I'm going to uh, start, yeah, I'm a school specialist improvement coach with uh, the district education department of Bangsa Pudu. Uh, it was a post which was created um, uh, when we started the, um, the new curriculum and, uh, you know, the blueprint and so on. Um, our former uh, uh, minister who was the education minister at that time, Muyudin, he actually start, uh, created this post. So we are his babies. Um, so uh, I wouldn't go. I won't go into that right now, considering his reputation at this point of time. So uh, what we do is we actually coach the teachers. Okay, we coach teachers and we support teachers and help teachers in um, in whatever way we can. Okay. Um, okay. So I shall actually focus on uh, my. Um, journey uh, teaching literature and now coaching literature. Uh, my journey, of course, I studied literature in Form 6 and then went on to do literature in, in a college and university and my master's and so on. But um, my journey in actually teaching literature in school started in 2010 when my son, who was in Form 5 then, came home uh, in February, you know, when they, they choose subjects and he came home and he said, mommy, nine subjects didn't look good. You was a science student. So I decided to take a 10th subject and I went, huh, what was the 10th subject you took? Then I signed up for literature. Then I said, why did you do that? I <laughs> imagine me, uh, you know, having done literature and all that. Of course, I love the subject, but, you know, you have only a few months left before SPM. And then he said, don't tell me you have got, you know, you have done your literature and you say you love literature, you can't teach me. Uh, but it was only then I realized how difficult it was to source for materials, to get stuff to actually teach literature. And I totally uh, understand teachers when they tell me that it's very difficult to get support and help. And that's the reason why now, uh, you know, as a uh, SISE, I try to help the literature teachers as much as I can, not only in KL, but uh, across to, uh, in other states as well. Okay, uh, just to share with you all, um, I was uh, very, very fortunate indeed to be part of the team that wrote the new curriculum for literature. Okay, um, you all know that the SPM literature previously, it was more of reading, memorizing, and producing what you have memorized, and you can still get an A+. Plus. Sorry, Keith, um, I know you, uh, that was your syllabus, and I, I thought literature in MBS. <laughs> okay, I thought literature in MBS. So, uh, so, uh, and that's how I got all my materials from in 2010, I finally got to teach literature when my son asked me, you know, and I went out and all and, and of course I got to teach literature and that time I was in MBS KL. So, it was very easy for students, even students, uh, you know, you to get an A or an A plus, but people of course had this fear that it was difficult for a student to get A or an A plus uh, for literature. It wasn't, but at the end of the day, I know we all love literature. We, we know it's about life and we, we you know, we, we like the subject, but in order, when, when you're talking about SPM literature at the end of the day, it's a, it's a subject for SPM. And when we talk about a subject for SPM, we know how enriching it is. But students at the end of the day would like to get that particular A. You know, the Kiasu MBS boys, Keith, uh, you know, the science students, they are forced to take literature. The, they are forced to take literature in MBS. And there are other schools where they force the SPM, uh, the, the first two classes to take literature, which I think is very good because when, when you, by forcing, you force them initially, but later they appreciate that they were forced to do the subject because they appreciate the subject later. Sometimes a little bit of force is needed. Okay, so um, so this uh, this in uh, you know there's some schools they, they they sort of force the students to do literature and so on, but they gain from that. Okay, so, um, but it was a subject, I would say I was not very happy and many uh, literature teachers, those of us who have the literature background, we were not happy with the curriculum in the sense that it was more of reading, um, you know, and it was more like comprehension level, like you an uh, uh, extract was given and you take three points and you answer, you can get five marks, you know, that sort of thing. So when I was called to be part of the team to write the new curriculum, I was very excited. And um, I'm even more excited now because our current curriculum is wonderful. It's really very, very good. And if anyone out there who says that, you know, our current curriculum for literature is not good, then they please take the book. I mean, please take our DSKP. 
uh, which you can find in the BPK website and look at it. It, it is very closely written, uh, very close to the IGCSE literature uh, syllabus. Okay, of course, the texts are our texts, our previous texts. Uh, we can't change the text at this kind of point of time because we know of the current situation, but uh, it is very much closely written uh, with IGCSE literature. The, and before it was curriculum was written, there was a test trial with three schools, uh, I mean, seven schools for three years. Okay, so, um, so we have things like, um, you know, the assessment objective one, two, three, and four, where we look at personalization, we look at uh, writer's techniques, we look at, you know, analyzing, reading between the lines and so on. So it's, it's really very, it's a challenging paper right now. It's a challenging subject, but students who do it will really gain from it. So, uh, but the problem now or the challenge now, okay, is getting students. Now, initially, when um, the different uh, divisions in the Ministry of Education, for example, um, of course, we start with um, BPK, uh, uh, BPK, ELCC, uh, the state education department and the district education department, the road shows they did and so on, they encouraged many schools to take up the subject. So we started with a new curriculum last year and this year the current form five students will be the first batch of students who are sitting, uh, will be sitting for the SPM paper. But I have been receiving feedback that some students are going to drop the paper. It is really sad. It's really sad. The reasons being, uh, of course, with the pandemic, um, doing any kind of study, the usual num uh, number of subjects they have to study, it's already very difficult, okay? And then you have an additional subject. And there's always this question which arises, uh, you know, no, no matter how much you try and persuade, I mean, how much you talk to the students, they may be interested. Sometimes they face uh, opposition from their parents who tell them, no, you don't need the subject. I have students who have dropped out because the parents feel they don't need the subject. They need to focus on their other subjects. Um, and then you have opposition from the principals of the school because you have this average grade of the school. And if you have students who sit for literature and, and the subject doesn't do well, it's going to bring the average grade down. So when you have a, a, a small number of students who want to sit for the subject, then the principal doesn't encourage them to sit for the subject, although they go out and get teachers and all who want to do, uh, you know, who are willing to help them. And then the other thing is the uh, shortage of English language teachers, uh, uh, a shortage of English language teachers uh, in most schools. So you see, if there, there are a few students who want to take the subject and let's say I go in and support the teacher and give her the materials and, and show her how to teach and so on. But then again, uh, that teacher is, because there's shortage of teachers, she will have to teach those students outside school hours. You see, she has to stay back and teach them. So how many teachers, of course, there are, there are many teachers who are willing to do that. But uh, we, uh, in some schools, the teachers are so overburdened because they really lack English language teachers. So they're not willing to stay back after school and do it outside school hours. So these are some of the challenges um, uh, the schools face, okay, in uh, uh, teaching literature in, in, as a subject in, in, in schools. And, um, but we are hoping, um, we are hoping that uh, by, you know, this, this year, we are giving as much support as possible to the students and the teachers as well. And like in KL, what we do is that, um, as I said, as much as we love literature, it is an examination subject. And I think to encourage students to, to take up the subject, you have to show them that it's easy to get an A+. plus. You know, you have to show them that. At the end of the day, that's reality. As much as, as much as we love the subject and all that, if the students feel they can get an A for the subject, more students will take up because that is the big fear out there. You know, uh, I want this uh, scholarship. I want that scholarship. Can I get my A? You know, can I get straight A's? We can't, we can't run away from that because that's the Malaysian mentality. That's the Asian mentality. And literature being a subject, which is a SPM subject, it falls into that category. So what in, we in KL do is that, you know, we, we, all the teachers at the schools which are doing uh, literature in KL, what we do is that on Thursdays, we sort of gather uh, and uh, we have this one hour session where the teachers take turns to discuss a poem or a, a prose and, and then uh, discuss a question and then the students try out because now it's online. These are the, uh, some, something good which has come out of the pandemic. So we are able to do it through Google Meet and the students you know, attempt a question and then 
we sit together, we discuss the answers and, and so on. So in that way, uh, what um, I'm doing is that I'm helping the teachers to, to uh, in a way, learn how to teach the subject. Because um, learning how to, knowing how to teach the subject and knowing the subject itself are two different things. Okay, um, so, and you have to go out of your way to learn it as well. Okay, and, um, and you must be inspired. Like, um, and then uh, the other good thing about the new curriculum is that it's not only about the examination part. We have our classroom-based assessment uh, uh, and, and so on. So under classroom-based assessment, we have this content standard, which is uh, produce literary works. Uh, okay, uh, this was something I was like, so, uh, I was so excited when they decided to put it into the curriculum. Because when I was teaching in MBS, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, despite the sub school having uh, 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 taught literature for many years, they have not, they did not have production of the place. Most of the time they did not have production of the place. So what I did was in 2013, um, I, I got some of the students to write the modern version of Hamlet. And we actually staged it. We staged it, we sold tickets and we staged it. And um, and, and what was exciting about this project was that, of course, the, the, the science students were involved. Uh, we had this Lidra club and the science students were involved. So, but when it came to the technical aspects and you know the costume and all that, they were not so creative. So we brought in the students from the art side who, 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 are, who are the quiet ones and all, but who had this talent. So we had this students from the first class and the students from the last class actually working together. And I thought that was a beautiful sight to behold to, you know, where they work together to produce um, the play, which was a, a big success. We did a musical. So, um, yeah, so, so these are the things. So this is part of the syllabus now where they're supposed to produce and it comes under classroom-based assessment. But uh, sadly, because of the pandemic I, and, you know, but of course there are other ways of doing it online, just like what um, uh, Emilia's, uh, Emilia's school has shown, her kids have shown, uh, there are other ways of doing it online as well. And I'm sure the teachers have uh, ventured into these avenues and looked at how they could still do the uh, content standard for. Okay, just to let you all know, uh, is my time up, Dr. Tu? Okay, this is uh, the pros. Uh, 30 the seconds. Marble by Bing Fong Ho. This is what they are doing. Okay, they, they are given a choice between uh, Ming Fong Ho and uh, Ming Fong Ho's The Clay Marble and The Lost King. Both are really uh, wonderful uh, novels for them, so they can choose between the two. And then there is this anthology of short stories. You have three stories by our local, uh, by our local writer. And, um, and we also have three stories by Ming Fong Ho here. And the poems come from here. There are 10 poems which they have to do. And all the 10 poems, uh, uh, they, they, the variety of poems, uh, nature and all that, but they belong to the canon and American literature and also modern. It covers different um, uh, periods of time. So this is a good collection as well, what they are doing. And for drama, they have three choices. They have flowers for Algernon. Uh, what is interesting is that this one, um, I remember reading it when I was 14 years old and I cried. I read the novel. Okay, I read the novel. And then, of course, you have the short story version of it. But what is interesting here is that this is a radio play. Okay, this is a radio play. So they have adapted it into a radio play. And I think it will be very interesting for teachers to actually produce this radio play as part of the content standard for as a, in a class. How we are going to bring about the effect, effects because we usually talk about stage production, but here we have something which is a radio play. And uh, of course, uh, another choice they have is Hope Springs, uh, which is not very popular with students, but I um, uh, probably it's not popular with teachers to, who choose them for the students. But I, I, I think it's a very, uh, it's, it's something that should look into. Uh, it's about teenagers in a correctional facility and it's really interesting to read. And finally, finally, what is uh, <laughs> literature without Shakespeare and we have the Merchant of Venice. <laughs> I can see Miss Shoba going this. Sorry, it's not Macbeth, but it's Merchant of Venice. So these are our books. Uh, these are our books for our Form 5 literature. And so you can see that um, uh, we, we actually, it's the thing, everything is there. You know, our curriculum is good. We have okay books, you know, okay. In fact, they're very good. Uh, it's a very good collection. But at the end of the day, it depends on the teachers. It depends on the teachers how it is 
carried out in class to inspire. But then, then again, it's also um, there must be this um, this whole uh, policy in our country where, like what uh, uh, Miss Sarina said, where you make it compulsory. You want to enter teachers training college to do TESOL, make sure you have literature. You know, doctors, make sure you have literature. You know, those kind of things must be there. Because if you don't have, if not say, not to say it must make it compulsory, but say that will be an added advantage and really implement this added advantage. Otherwise, we can sit here and talk about how lovely literature is and all that. But the number of students who are taking the subject, there's not going to be much of a difference. I'm, I mean, this is what I feel uh, being a uh, in, in the in the district education department and you know KL we have quite a number of schools taking literature but the number of uh, classes or students who are doing is dwindling. Uh, Keith previously MBS used to have three three classes. This year they are having only one class of literature. You see, so the numbers are dwindling. So we we have to do something about it. But it goes beyond the teacher. It goes beyond district education department. It all depends on the ministry and how they go about um making it attractive and saying that literature is necessary uh you know for students uh for to, to get a place in higher education okay thank you i think i'll stop here <laughs> well that's really interesting uh i'm not such a young guy you know though i have baby face but i'm very old guy already <laughs> i didn't that say was you looked young <laughs> 30, 36 years ago when i was doing my my lead in MBS, we were the first batch, all right, by Mrs. Okay. Sally T. And uh, frankly, for literature, not anybody dares to do it. They only offer it to five science one and five science two, the so-called relatively smarter ones. And there's no art student joining the literature class. Yes. The, it's 100% science one and science two student in the lead class. We have fabulous, fabulous time, actually. So, but I'm not sure what is happening to MBS KL now, whether they still continuing. And frankly, right, as the as people say, like we are nerds, you know, actually you have to be smart to do lit, you know? And a lot of people, the the tahap, uh, the level of English is not high enough to do lit, you know. You have to be very good in English before you can even dare to move into a lit class, actually. All right. So Frankly, it's really a hangout for nerds if you want to do literature class, <laughs> which is rightly so the theme for this this uh this this gathering or this hangout. Thank you so much. Actually, it's really uh, so so exciting to to hear from a specialist like you. Do join us more Thank often you. and serve more <laughs> often you. with the team here. Thank you, Gladys. Thank you. All right, we will have some guest speakers from our. Uh, nominated by our speakers as well. And uh, later, uh, Wei Kiong will also uh, add in some comments and uh, some questions from the audience from Facebook and uh, yeah, from, from all the various Facebook channels. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to invite uh, our first guest uh, speaker, invited by uh, Shoba, uh, Dr. Abdullah from UTM. All right one of her most loved students <laughs> and the things that uh, I'm sure Dr. Abdullah will inspire. Over to you, Dr. Abdullah. Oh, we can't hear you. The bike is not on. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. Is, uh, can you hear me now? Awesome. Oh, thank you very much. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, great to be with uh, everybody with such a, a great crowd. And uh, it's a totally fantastic experience. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Abdullah Muhammad Nawi, and people normally just call me Dr. A for short. I've been teaching uh, literature on and off uh, at multiple levels, and now I teach in UTM. And a few things in my limited time here. Um, I teach at both levels, at undergrad levels and at postgrad levels, uh, and both require different levels of depth, of understanding and analysis. Um, and I think that uh, right now, the 
this uh, this uh, these sessions uh, will be really really useful for me because uh, I have ten PhD students under me right now and five are doing uh, literature and one of the things which uh, which I've found to be a problem uh, with students at PhD level is um, it's synthesizing information. So it's not just enough for them to be able to read literature, to read this and uh, understand, but to put together the wealth of information that is that they're studying and to present it in a package that is understandable to the reader. Now that is one of the one of the biggest challenges that I have for my own students who are doing their PhDs, especially because some of them are from the Middle East and it's a bit difficult uh, for them to express themselves well. Um, and this is where I, when I saw uh, Masaki share his resources, <laughs> the, suddenly had a light bulb moment and I, and I looked at them and I, and I just thought, oh my God, my students need this, <laughs> my students need this. And I was just so happy. So I'm really hoping that uh, we can, we can uh, uh, do something there. Uh, I, I do have one last thing to say, uh, 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 and this goes back to the comment that Dr. Ramesh uh, made in the beginning, which was the fear of literature. And I think that there are two ways to, that there's a tension uh, right in the middle where you have, number one, people are afraid of literature because it seems like there is this stigma that one needs to be a specialist in order to access literature. And people are afraid because if they say that this and they say that, then it's not going to be considered as, you know, proper. Um, so there is a fear. And, and this is also because there are some gatekeepers within our community who actually say that um, to study literature, yes, you can read it, but to really uh, understand and talk about it, you need to have a certain amount of skill. So there's 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 that bit there, and also there is the other side as well, where we need to be able to let people talk freely about literature, but at the same time, they need to have something in their heads to talk about. So for me, where I am, it's always interesting to navigate the space in between, especially when we, we are dealing uh, with postgraduate students. Um, there's a lot more to say, but I think that that's, that's about it. Uh, it's great to be here again. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, team. Thank you, Ms. Shoba. <laughs> for bringing me in. Uh, thanks a lot. Back to you, Keith. Thank you very much. You're muted, Keith. Keith, yeah. You're muted. Oh, sorry, it is the first rule. <laughs> I think what is the most common tagline is, you're muted <laughs> in, in, in this age, actually. Okay. Uh, the things that we would like to invite the next uh, a speaker uh, nominated by our friend, uh, Ms. Nimana Naden, uh, to, to share with us. Uh, before that, uh, Wei Kiong, any special comment from the, from the media? Not, not at the moment. Everyone seems to be quiet right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry to keep you guys waiting, and I'm sure everybody looking forward to hear uh, Madam Nimala Naden share with us. Thank you for joining us. Over to you. Please unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, yes. fantastic. Okay. Good, yes. So uh, basically, I'm just going to give you a timeline. I was a former uh, principal of Convent Bukit Nanas and uh, secondary school and how I introduced literature as one of the subjects that must be taken. As Gladys said, compulsory or forced, okay? But um, when I was there in 2014, it was an, I mean, it has always been an elective subject, but there were less than 15 students and it was done outside the classroom, outside the timetable. So I realized that students were not taking it seriously. 
and I was a very I was very passionate with English literature. And I decided that in 2015, I made it compulsory. So I made it as usual compulsory for the two top classes, the science classes. Of course, I had to convince the parents and the teachers because you know it's all about the A plus, whether the students can get the A plus. But I told them it adds value to the SPM cert because in terms of scholarship and also it enriches them in the proficiency of the language as well as the maturity of thought. So I had about 70 students from both classes. And uh, I had to convince them that they have to read beyond their mere textbook that they have, you know, being science stream, uh, science stream students. And also I had to my advantage, a teacher who's a major in English literature. So why not? So I introduced a subject. So it wasn't a problem because uh, it was added into the timetable. So once it's in the timetable, so both classes had English literature. And uh, it was also in 2016 that the Ministry of Education uh, it was a pioneer project under them, and Convent Bukit Nanas was one of the schools for the IGCSE English Literature. And uh, this, of course, opened a whole new prospect for them. And from what I see, you know, what I've seen, because basically I'm a language teacher, so I teach one class. So when I do poem with them, it is interesting to notice how the students and the girls will ask me a lot of questions and being a teacher at that point and not an administrator, I find that we have to find sometimes uh, explanation that you can't get just by reading it at once. So I had to go to the internet and look for information and we used to discuss. And it is important to nurture that there's no right or wrong answers. It's how convincing you are to make the person believe. And I was very fortunate because I also had Gladys helping me out. And Miss Anusha was the English literature teacher. So generally the girls did well and they were very passionate about it. And the highlight of it is always during the English week, we have drama. This is part of CBN culture. The drama is the highlight. And that is the time you can see the creativity, the expression, and I hope it still continues till today. And from my perspective, I find that literature opens a whole new world for the students because it teaches them to be sensitive and everything is not black and white. There's always a gray area and that is why, and you also ask why certain decisions are made by the characters and what is the justification for it? There is always a why, it's not a when and a where all the time. So it is more, of, uh, you know, you start to think and there's thought processes going on to get to the answer. And uh, till today, I'm glad Conan Bukit Nana still has two classes of uh, students taking literature in English. And I hope it continues to do so. I hope so. Anusha, are you there? I hope you are doing a good job. So thank yes, you. Yes, I'm here. I'm here, Ponirvala. Okay, but I've been kicked you. out so many times. I hope I don't get kicked out now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That's it. So, Anusha, you are next. Yes. Okay. Hi, Keith, and hi, everyone. Good evening again. <clears throat> uh, I'm, okay. Kashmiri, can you find Anusha? Yeah, uh, yeah. Anusha, I, could you turn on your camera, please? Yeah, I did. I did. Okay. Yep. Fantastic. Over to you. All right. Okay. I, I, I'm very glad to be in a school where uh, students enjoy literature. Okay. I have uh, to thank Juan Nirmala for making the science, the two first two science classes compulsory to take literature. Initially, we had our problem. I think Juan Nirmula already discussed this, but eventually the students stayed on and took the subject and scored. Okay, and what I understand is some of them went on to take up 
uh, literature do in their A levels and later on to do their even their masters. Okay, and they always come back and thank me. And of course, Puan Nirmala and Gladys. Gladys is also one of them who comes very close by to CBN to help us out. So uh, in a way, I think the subject, as far as I'm concerned, it will not die in CBN. We still have two classes, Puan Nirmala. We still have two classes. And because of IGCSC, the students are very, very interested in the paper. Initially, we had 60 over, more than 60 over students because they wanted to take the IGCSE paper. It started off with 70, then it dropped by. When during this SPM, I still maintain the 60, 60 uh, I mean, 60 students who, who take up the subject. Okay, so we are encouraging more classes, but we don't like, like what Gladys said, we don't have enough teachers. Okay, some of us are also teaching English. That is our biggest problem. And we, why are they interested in the subject is we have our language week every year. Okay, our language, language week comprises of drama competition within the Form 4 classes and also poetry recitation. And how it's done, they have to write their own script and they have to come up with different ideas. So this encourages them to read more on drama techniques and all this. So for this past two years, we have not been conducting drama uh, competition. So we are doing it online. And I see the feedback still very good as we see them face to face. So we are still promoting all these genres in uh, CBN. And I hope that it will carry on even if I leave the school. All right, I, I, I want to thank Puan Nirmala here and Gladys for always coming out and helping. Although Puan Nirmala is retired, but I always call her off and on to seek her advice and help. Thank you again, Puan Nirmala and Puan Gladys. Gladys, thank you again for helping out with the marking scheme. You know, she always helps out with the marking scheme. We My don't pleasure, know what is the Anisha. actual marking scheme now. The new syllabus, you know, we are all quite blur, but... Gladys steps in to help most of the schools in KL. I hope more schools will take up the subject. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone. I enjoyed listening to you, although I had to, you know, be, I've been kicked out in and out so many times. So I'm so sorry because of my line is very unstable today. Thank you again. Thanks, Anusha, for sharing. In fact, uh, we need people like like Gladys and uh, Pon Nimala who, I mean, keep coming back, keep coming back and coming back and coming back to, to help and serve. We need teachers who is, uh, people say lifelong learner, you're a lifelong teacher actually, that, that makes the difference to many lives, right? Prof too? Uh, Wake up. <laughs> yes, I think all of us are still in the institutions, the teacher training. I think that's what our roles are. So make sure that we incorporate literature. I think it's, it's part of life, just like throughout the, the theme for today. I think the ministry is trying their very hard. The teachers uh, on the grounds, they are running. So us who are in the teacher institutions, we are also doing our part. I think everyone's doing our part. I think finally, because all, all of us, we have the same well, goal at the end of the day. Yeah. So the next speaker, who is that? Uh, Janice Lau, a uh, literature enthusiast. So yes. the things and over to you, Janice. Uh, your 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 nomi, your your friend nominated you that you're one of the best in this area. So we are looking forward to hear you share. Thank over you. to you, Janice. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, having me, and I really enjoyed the great repertoire from the uh, what you call these uh, new methods and new researches and all. Um, but I look at it as um, there's so much of challenges ahead of this literature that all of us love. And although you're an enthusiast or you're an expert, you still have these challenges. So I look at uh, Professor Ramesh and he said that, no, why are so few students taking the paper? And uh, why, why kids don't like reading by uh, uh, Dr. Sarina, you know? And... Um, also, fewer and fewer teachers, there are, not, there are not enough teachers for literature. So in order to get so, I mean, this, these, are real, these are really real problems that we're going to have. Uh, having taught in primary school and uh, 
the standard of English was so low and is getting worse. And also teaching in secondary school literature and um, finding my students not even to, able to differentiate between uh, he is and they say he am and I, I were, or, you know, they, they couldn't even differentiate the pronouns and uh, the verb agreement. How would they be able to enjoy literature, you know? So I had that. Uh, the greatest part in my life for literature was when I entered teacher's training. And I really enjoyed, like, Shoba was my colleague, and you know how much I worked with her as a team. And <laughs> we enjoyed the students, the literature, as well as, uh, you know, the, the teamwork and, and the students' work as well. So it was, you know why we enjoyed it? We enjoyed it because the students were good. And also like uh, uh, the Nirmala, Nirmala, she was the headmistress and she said the students were forced to take literature. And I think that's one of the areas whereby uh, Kementrian had to work at it, whereby could literature be, <laughs> sorry, forced? It shouldn't be like that, but you know, because otherwise the students like in the Teachers Training Institute, they have to pass and they have to, you know, have to pass literature. And therefore, they really worked hard. The costumes for drama, Merchant of Venice, Macbeth, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, they did the newspaper. Every year we see them improving, you know, and it was such an interesting uh, time together with them, you know. So I believe that um, when the students are good in English, you enjoy it. And when they are forced to, sorry, pass a subject, they are very enthusiastic because it's like, you know, they, it's their rice bowl, you know, they have to get through with it. So I believe that uh, Kementrian is the most important driving factor here, whereby, you know, the lifeline of literature is pro pro probably, you can say, in their heads. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with Hi, us. Shoba, for introducing me to this group. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing it uh, with us. Okay, so right now it's the time is, okay, six minutes to six minutes to six. So, so let's be mindful of the time. I know it's very, very good. <laughs> I believe that this will not be the last. It will be only the beginning. I think we've got many people together um, let's set up a database and all this. Uh, let me, from my site, from University of Nottingham School of Education, let's see how I could really keep the momentum going and working with different parties and all this. So, Kit, over to you. Who's the we, next? We have. Uh, we are very mindful of time. We have three more uh, guests, okay. and each one of you just one minute ish. Uh, I know you will want to stay forever, but really, sometimes in life, there's also a time limit that we have to keep. So the next person we'd like to invest, uh, invite is uh, Miss Alicia. She's a believer in literature. So over to you, Alicia. Thank you so much, Keith. Okay, just to check, can everyone hear me well? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay. So I'm just to introduce myself a bit. I'm Alicia and I'm currently studying in Health University and I'm taking psychology as my degree course. So just a heads up to everyone uh, that my sharing will be a a little bit philosophical. Uh, thanks to Miss Lawrence as well that she made me into here. So I want to start off with why students and I'm uh, why students and sometimes even myself as well. Why students say that and coming from a college or university standpoint, why high school students, why students say that I didn't learn anything in high school, I didn't learn anything in secondary school, and basically it's because Whatever stays in school, stays in school. Whatever we learn in school, stays in school. Whatever we learn in the books, stay in books. And I'm sure the teachers here will be very familiar with this phrase where uh, you will say things like, you have to read this. This will come out in the exam. This is going to come out in PT3. This is going to come out in SPM. This is going to come out in SDPM. This is going to come out in the exam. Please focus on it. So I'm sure the teachers here are very familiar with that. But then again, if this will come out in exam, will this come out in will this come out in life as well? Like, can this information that we learn in exam can be applied in life? So, coming back to it, 
what is the point what is the point of learning literature when I'm taking psychology and when psychology is you learn about the human mind and behavior so where is the literature in that and why am I here sharing it so um, many of the speakers here they say like there is more than just literature there is more than just literature literature is something beyond that and I myself I am living in that beyond I'm living in that the more of literature so coming back to this uh, I am not familiar with any of the writers the authors the books that were mentioned by previous speakers I apologize for that but I'm not familiar with those and I don't know any of them but I know that literature is a form of art in words which translates into an emotion when it's understood and felt so even though it's just words it's not there's no colors there is no action it's just words you have to visual and visual and read it but it translates into an emotion because we understand it and literature is like you not only see you not only read and not only understand but you're also putting yourself in the author's shoes and perspective and allowing yourself to get invested in it. So because of uh, my experience learning literature with Miss Lawrence, she, her way of teaching not only teaches us about the poem, like for example, what happened to Lulu, but she also initiates uh, activities like debates, discussions, group discussions and presentations. And through that, we manage. Uh, for me personally, I managed to brush up my leadership skills. I was a uh, president in a club for nearly two years. I was secretary in two clubs at one point. Uh, communication skills, soft and hard skills, and presentation skills, which I'm currently doing now. And so thank you again to Ms. Lawrence for providing me the opportunity to be here. And... I can see that some of the speakers that they have their own favorite authors, they have their own favorite books. And why we have a favorite authors and books is because it how it makes us feel, how it makes us feel emotionally. And maybe it initiates in, insights and emotion, anger, disgust, curiosity, sadness, all those emotions. And that's what makes us like something because of the emotion that it brings us. So coming from a student studying psychology and you all teachers out there that are very passionate in literature, all humans have emotion. And if you can reach and touch their emotion through literature or through anything at all, really, if you can touch their emotion, everything changes. Everything changes. So I'm not saying, you know, the goal of teaching literature is to make them cry. No, not that. No, but you know, if it happens, if it happens that the student cries while presenting, then I guess that is your proof that you have touched them emotionally. So thank you so much, uh, Keith, for providing the opportunity. And thank you so much for the panel uh, speakers for having me here. Yes, thank you so the, much. The English yeah. literature teachers actually changes lives, right? We can, isn't it? Yes, true? absolutely. And thank you so much, Alicia, for stopping by. At least, you see, we've got a voice from students bottom up. Well done, Lauren. Yeah, you should be very, very proud of yourself. <laughs> yeah, congrats, Lawrence. All right, the next speaker, guest speaker will be Shanti. Shanti, are you here? Over to you, Shanti. Do unmute yourself, Shanti. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes perfect. Okay, thank you very much. I am indeed very inspired today with uh, listening to all the inspirational speakers here. Thank you, Lawrence, for giving me this opportunity. I never really expected to be uh, live today. Uh, Ms. Shoba, I'm so, so, so inspired by you. I just wish that you had been my literature teacher and so uh, all the other speakers as well. And I know Keith is fighting for time, so I won't take too much of your time. So what I'm going to speak to you all uh, uh, from my perspective is uh, the perspective of a passionate teacher for student-centeredness learning in literature. Sad to say that uh, the school that I'm teaching in or the district where I'm teaching in, um, 
literature per se is not offered because of the standard of English and also the challenges that students face. However, uh, what I do as a passionate teacher is I love literature. I did literature as minor in my degree, but unfortunately, um, I'm not able to teach this text. But however, I employ whatever I have learned um, and with my passion uh, in the small L that we, uh, that we teach in school. So what I'm, uh, in short, what I'm trying to say to all other teachers that I'm sure there are so many other teachers like me who actually can teach literature, but because they are teaching in circums challenging circumstances, uh, probably they can just teach the small L. Just remember that we as teachers, we hold the fort, okay? Um, we are there as facilitators and guides to them and we can do wonders. And this is actually a, 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 mo a, sh a shift in motivating the students. Uh, we can empower them and it also validates our professionalism. Okay. And we, this is the only uh, subject or, you know, uh, literature is where we can actually play the role of a teacher, where we can create an atmosphere that generate autonomous uh, student learning. And we've heard a lot about uh, autonomous learning here from all the other speakers as well. So what I try to do is like uh, with the small L, like, um, I do a lot of collaborative and uh, cooperative and collaborative strategies with them, even though the students are very weak. But I, I believe that I must give them the experience of literature with whatever knowledge that I have. I create a platform for them where in their very little, little way, they can savor literature and they can, you know, uh, develop their comprehension skills, their interpreting skills. And of course, I have to like uh, differentiate it to their level, just in order for them to be able to one day say that I have gone through the process of learning literature. So I think teachers play a very important role in this journey of um, injecting uh, literature skills, literature learning uh, tools, as well as the skills uh, to develop them, to develop their humane qualities, as uh, Mr. Masaki put in just now, he said the human condition. So I believe that we as teachers play a very important role in developing our students' uh, humane qualities, mainly being empathetic, sympathetic, and, uh, you know, and we can teach them our ways of justification, uh, making justifications to make a stand in real life. It may be just be a simple stand, but at least they will have the pleasure of being able to say, hey, I did it. That's my point of view in whatever way they, you know, they present it. So, and it also create a, a zone for freedom of expression. So it all lies in the hand of the teacher uh, who, who, who introduces literature and instills the love for literature. There's so much that I would like to say. I'm also equally passionate, but I am also still learning, you know. I, I, I'm about to retire in three years' time, but I still attend all these webinars. And, you know, I feel that there's still a whole lot of things that I still have to learn. So on that note, uh, I, I hope that teachers out there do not be um, disappointed or, you know, make sure that uh, you give your best, you know, if we don't, who else is going to do it, right? Uh, before I leave, I would like to just uh, share this quote from E.M. Foster on literature. He said that what is wonderful about great literature is that it transforms the man who reads it towards the condition of the man who wrote and brings to birth in us also the creative impulse. On that, I wish everyone a good day and long live literature. Thank you for the opportunity again. Thank you, okay. Shanti. Really long cool. Live, long live literature. <laughs> yeah, long live literature, yeah. <laughs> okay. In fact, uh, you, you see, you have a lot of uh, abang and kaka in this room actually. Get to know them, hunt them down, stalk them. And if you can, get Shoba to do a special literature yes. class as your guest speaker for you. She'll love doing it. And don't only invite literature students, invite all your students in. And you will have some people converted like religion to be new believers in literature. <laughs> okay? So, I believe so be mindful of that, right? We make Thank it all right. True, right? Thank you. Okay, yep. thanks. So the last speaker. 
Who is that? The last speaker, Majida, or we, we commonly known as Jade. Uh, you know, Jade actually uh, serves in the private education department of MOE, and uh, she is one of Shoba's favorite students. So over to you, Jade. Hey, hello, all the nerds. All right. <laughs> Thank you for having me, and um, I really appreciate this hangout session. Um, yeah, you all can be jealous that um, I was Miss Shoba's uh, student. Okay, I didn't give a, a very easy time. I was one of the weakest students, I think. But she changed um, my life and my other friends' life as well. Through literature, of course. Okay, And I think she, she saw herself a bit short just now. There were many other methods that, that she used in the teacher in the teacher training college, MPIK. All right, I remember very well when she took me and my friends to this video room, okay? She was trying to, 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 to teach uh, war poems, all right? And there was one poem about Wilfred Owen and it was, everybody knows Wilfred Owen. It's not easy to understand, the culture is different. So she took us to watch some movies, all right? To, to show us, you know, how death is really terrible. She wanted to convey that. And she used a lot of movies. So she used a lot of videos, okay? And so all these things really help us understand uh, what was going on um, in the poems, okay? So I thought that was really effective for us, uh, especially when we deal with poems which are not... Um, similar to our culture here and time especially setting was also different okay um there's so many things that i want to share but i just want to say if i were a student now i would really love to have shanti with me mishoba with me all right because they really have passion for uh literature and i just want to remind that literature has started right before we, we learn lit, uh, Shakespeare's work, okay? You know, like shape poems can be used, and this is also taught to us in the teacher training college, all right? Uh, poems as simple as shape poems can really help beginners or students who are struggling with the language, okay, to love the language first. I think if they have the love for language, then anything else that comes beyond beyond sentence level, you know, beyond paragraph level will be easy for them to fall in love with. So uh, that is another thing that um, I totally appreciate and which I use as a teacher with my weaker students, all right? And literature is not just for students who are good, it's for everybody, all right? And, and I think it comes a lot from the teacher themselves. If they love what they do, all right, then the students will feel it and they will love whatever you tell them. Just look at me. I believe anything that Ms. Roba tells me, okay? All right. Um, I think that's all. I'm, I'm going to keep it very short. Thank you, everyone, for your sharing session. I think it has been a wonderful evening, well spent. Um, don't kill literature. Don't, don't, don't murder literature with with rigid rules and you know um, and uh, requirements for, to take it when you are when you're taking it as an elective paper, I wish I wish everybody will have the opportunity to learn all the texts that we have right in school. That would be great because then then everybody will get to see how beautiful literature is. That's all from me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, so, so much. Yes, yeah, absolutely great to have you as uh, someone ending. I always applaud, I must say, I always applaud friends who from Ministry of Edu uh, Education to come out and share information with us. I think uh, we need to have more exchanges like this because sometimes just by being there, just by being there, we know that you, you guys have our backs and just to tell us that, okay, we are doing the right things. Just being there, it means so much, I think for the teachers, for all of us here. And please continue to do the good work 
for all for the Malaysia as well as thank you so much to all the speakers. Thank you, Keith, for organizing this. And thank you, Ministry of uh, Education, Melta. Well, not to forget University of Nottingham School of <laughs> Education <laughs> to support this event because I believe that this is an ongoing process. Um, like I said, it will not be the last, it's just the beginning. So Keith, do you have anything to say before we end today's session? I'll, I'll give Shoba the last word. Shoba, over to you, the last word before we, we end the session. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, sometimes I feel very worried because my name is being mentioned over and over again. <laughs> but just, just remember this year, there are so many beautiful people out there and lovers of literature who must be given the opportunity to share their talents with us and get new speakers for every webinar. I think that's very, very important. And again, long live literature. Thank you, everybody. Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you for sharing, Shoba. The thing is that uh, we may consider having a once a term literature hangout or once a quarter literature hangout, okay? So I will leave it to the, all the speakers and panels today to add your friends and your people into our literature WhatsApp group. And we'll discuss from there whether we should have this, uh, this hangout more often as well as uh, probably we go specific into a book or specific in a topic or specific into a certain exam group or something like that. With that, we thank you all for serving together with us and for participating and uh, for hanging out. Uh, much of every good thing have to come to an end, uh, but we can extend it in the other session. So have a very uh, wonderful evening and uh, enjoy your dinner. Take good care of yourself and stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Have a pleasant evening. Bye. Bye. Yep.